American Football League kicks off the 1966 season, spotlighting its newest team, the Miami Dolphins. The Dolphins' debut must go down in football history as the most thrilling first play ever made by any new team anywhere. Joe Auer takes the opening kickoff and races 95 yards for a touchdown. Shula came in 1970. We changed coaches, but the team was transformed. Touchdown! No-name defense became sort of symbolic of a defense that, with a, not a lot of known players, became a terrific defense to be on. Going on a field just sort of happened. You know, winning all the games. Nobody had done it before that. Nobody's done it since then. Touchdown, Larry Zonka! And the Dolphins have now established clear superiority in this game. Marino, it doesn't take long for the thought to go from the mind to the arm to let go of the football. Going deep up the sideline, man down, touchdown! Dan Marino has broken another record. Coaching is taking the personnel that you have and getting the most out of their ability. Coach Shula becomes the all-time winningest coach in the history of the National Football League. Discipline! Discipline! I can bring my daughter out here and go through this drill. Buckle up, chin straps, prima donnas! Defense rises to the occasion. He will force a tackle to do something the tackle doesn't want to do. Ball is stripped from the backside. Flutie back now looking. He's at the ball! Zach Thomas delivered a Christmas present. We the vision chance! And that whole Murphy shot dropping one by Ricky Williams. Well, okay, it's not playbook now. Rex snap to Ronnie Brown. Goes to the right. He's got it! And the Mark Norfolk to the champions of the AFC. Miami of the early 1960s was America's vacation paradise, boasting a variety of leisure activities. The one attraction the city did not have was a big league sports franchise. An ambitious attorney from South Dakota decided to do something about it. Joe Robbie was the poorest owner in the history of North American major league sports. But I had tremendous respect for him because nobody ever gave Joe Robbie anything. He grew up dirt poor in the plains of the Dakotas, worked his way through law school, and I guess started the Miami Dolphins with something like $10,000 of his own money. I've been enormously impressed uh, the entire time I've been in Miami with the uh, enthusiasm of the football fan. And he was able to do what men far wealthier than him were unable to do, and that was bring Major League Sports to the state of Florida. In 1966, the American Football League announced the entry of its newest club, the Miami Dolphins. The Dolphins moved quickly to find office space, while Robbie looked anywhere he could to secure additional business partners. I worked at WIOD in Miami. I did a nightly radio show from Surfside 6, the houseboat that was a very famous television show and they let us use that boat for our radio show. So we were docked opposite the Fontainebleau on the Inland Waterway. Many great guests who would come stay at the Fontainebleau and come across the street. And then along come Danny Thomas and this group, and they bring the Miami Dolphins. The Miami Dolphins come to town. Amid all the bright lights and pretty girls that are synonymous with Miami, Florida, the American Football League kicks off the 1966 season, spotlighting its newest team, the Miami Dolphins. Danny was had maybe 1% of the team. Joe Robbie put the whole package together. Joe was a genius of sorts. Robbie's work was just beginning. The franchise faced a virtual two-minute drill, publicizing the team, selling tickets, signing players, and establishing practice facilities. They were new to getting together, the coaches were new, and they were trying to put a team together. And really, I guess it seemed like they put it together so fast, they didn't really plan where they were going to work out, or what the schedule was going to be, or what kind of food they were going to have. It was just like, seemed to me like it was all put together in one month. We practiced on a field that was at one of the local junior highs or high school there, which was, I mean, it had seashells on the field, and it wasn't even a football field. They just marked it off as like a part of a beach area almost. The playing surface at the Orange Bowl was a much faster track. As the Dolphins and their celebrity co-owner discovered the night of the first game in franchise history. Enjoying every moment of opening night is comedian Danny Thomas, co-owner along with Joseph Robbie. Looks like Danny knows his football. The 
Hopkins' debut must go down in football history as the most thrilling first play ever made by any new team anywhere. Joe Auer from nearby Coral Gables High School and a Georgia Tech alumnus takes the opening kickoff and races 95 yards for a touchdown. Joe Auer took the opening kickoff and Danny Thomas ran down the sidelines with him. As he ran, Danny ran. Many years later, Johnny Carson asked him for his most memorable moment, and he said, well, the most memorable moment in his career uh, was when Joe Auer ran the opening kickoff of the Miami Dolphin franchise back for a touchdown. And God, I sat up in bed and went, did I just hear my name on the Johnny Carson show? Danny Thomas wasn't the only Dolphin with show business savvy. Number 54, Wahoo McDaniel, was the only player in the league to sport his first name on the back of his jersey. This helped promote Wahoo's other occupation as a professional wrestler. The full-blooded Native American sported traditional headdress while moonlighting in the ring, sometimes sandwiched between football practice. So I was wrestling there at the same time, which worked out good for me. Is I lived in Tampa in the off-season, and I wrestled all over Florida. One year at a training camp, I went and wrestled Gene Kaniski for the World's Championship five days after we were in camp. I scrimmaged that morning, went and laid down for a while, scrimmaged that afternoon, drove to Miami, wrestled an hour draw, and drove back and got up the next morning and ran and scrimmaged another hour. Wahoo's additional earnings came in hand. The Dolphins struggled on the field and at the box office, putting Miami's cash-strapped ownership in a deep financial hole. I was sent to pick up the projector at the repair place, and I had to pay for it with my own money because they wouldn't let me, the Dolphins didn't have good enough credit. They wouldn't bill the Dolphins, and I had to pay for it with my own money. And uh, one time, the, the dry cleaners that cleaned our uniform held our uniforms up. The club also had to pinch pennies when it came to traveling expenses. I think the team was trying to save money. And so we flew a lot of prop jobs, you know, propeller-driven planes at first year. And so I was, you know, I was, hey, listen, we're a professional team here. When you play for the Miami, anywhere you go is a long flight. So we had a trip out to San Diego, and we took a flight called Zantop. I never heard of an airline, you know? And we flew for 10 hours to get there. Zantop, I still remember that name. The seats were very tiny. The top where you put your luggage had beds on it where they folded down. And it was a long, long, miserable flight out there, and it was even worse coming back because we lost the game. The only dolphin who seemingly enjoyed comfortable surroundings was Flipper, the team mascot, happily frolicking in his end zone water tank. Being an expansion team, you needed a lot of things to perhaps draw people into it. And Flipper was very popular at that time. He would throw the footballs back out, you know, our field goals and extra points when it was going to that end zone. So Flipper was cool. Whenever the Dolphins score, Flipper would go up and jump through the hoop. They decided they didn't score enough, so he would jump up on first downs. We made a first down, Flipper jump. For number 32, Joe Auer, the team's MVP during its first season, the Animal Kingdom was familiar territory. Joe Auer was probably a, a, the team kooks, uh, and, and that might be unfair. Joe Auer was just very different and very kind of strange in his own way. But he had a couple of, of unique pets where you were very careful when you went in his room. <laughs> I did own an alligator. The alligator was a small pet alligator. I had to end up giving it to a circus. I had a lot of fun with that, and I've always been an animal lover. His pet lion was named Clifford. And, uh, the lion had been abandoned, or mother was killed, or well, whatever. But Joe had a, a, a cub whose eyes had not opened yet. And when the eyes opened, Joe was with the bottle feeding Clifford and uh, thought that Joe was the mother. Fortunately, Auer was not also responsible for nurturing player talent. For that task, the dolphins turned elsewhere. What was there? was a guy named Joe Thomas. He was a personnel director, and he had started putting the talent together on that football team. Our receivers overall are good. Uh, there's a few spots, of course, uh, everybody's looking for the big running back, everybody's looking for... Don Shula eventually was the man who made all the pieces march, but Joe Thomas gave the pieces to Don Shula, and without Thomas, they could never have been what they were. Made the deal that got him Paul Warfield, 
made the deals that got them, Larry Little, Bob Kuchenberg, Jim Langer. It was all Joe Thomas's talent acquisition. An early prize was 1967 first round pick Bob Greasy, who Thomas chose over local hero Steve Spurrier. I always kidded Joe. I said, Joe, people in South Florida, you would not have taken the Heisman Trophy winner from Gainesville, and you were going to take this kid from Indiana? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. Now, uh, how about introducing your lovely bride here one day? This is Judy, my one day wife. Judy, well, he, he feels pretty optimistic about his chances of uh, starting with the Dolphins. You've seen him play. You think he can do it? I sure do. Well, I'm, she... I'm behind him all the way. Good. Well, I would imagine so, especially after one day of marriage, right? <laughs> okay. I got her on my side. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Have a nice honeymoon, and we look forward to you coming back next week. This is Bob Greasy. The fate of the Miami Dolphins rests in his strong rookie right arm. He knows it, the enemy knows it, and the fans know it. In the late 60s, Greasy was often asked to shoulder the offensive load all by himself. But even as the Dolphins kept losing, they were slowly gaining more talent on their roster. Myself and Jim Kick came in 68, Dick Anderson came in 68, Doug Cruzan came in 68. All those people were acquired or walked on the field or somehow were transferred via Joe Thomas's office. He put the nucleus of what would later be the only undefeated team ever together. After four straight losing seasons in Miami, head coach George Wilson retired from football. The Dolphins surrendered their first round draft pick to secure the services of Baltimore Colts coach Don Shula. The two men could not have been more different. Shula came in 1970. We changed coaches, but the team was transformed. We were people who actually had to practice. With George Wilson, if it was too hot, we went swimming. With Don Shula, we never had a drink of water in the field in seven years. Shula comes in and instills one heck of a work ethic on it. Uh, that, that first training camp, we were going four times a day. You know, when I got down there in 1970, I didn't really know how good some of these players were, but I knew that I had to just start from scratch and, and instill in them our system and our determination to compete and to win. I think the first thing I, I told them was that uh, I was about as subtle as a punch in the mouth. <laughs> what I said was what I meant. Hold up, hold up. What the hell's wrong with our snap count? Back in a huddle, let's go. What was the call? He really treated everybody the same, you know, kind of like dirt. And uh, he'd yell and scream and jump up and down. Hey, fight! Fight! Get in there, let's go! Today, 35 years later, I said, you know, I used to get aggravated at you yelling at me on the field. And he says, I yelled at you because I knew you'd play harder. Shula's Dolphins played harder and better. I believe there was 20 to 22 young players hit that team in 1970, and that was the core of that team for several years afterwards. We believed in that system. We got to the point where we, we started to think like those coaches thought personally about the game, and it occupied your thoughts all the time. Consequently, it was that group of players that made that team so mentally tough. Almost overnight, the Dolphins were transformed from doormat to dynamo thanks to Shula's system and aggressive ownership. No one coach wins championships. No one player wins championships, but it's an organization. Joe Robbie was a great owner for me because although he didn't have any money, he spent, he spent whatever he had. He borrowed a lot to get you know, done what we wanted to get done. Quite coincidentally, he felt that there was an opportunity for him to get me from Cleveland and it was a part of a deal that involved a draft choice. Miami's number one pick in the 1970 draft, and the Dolphins were drafting in the third position. How on earth anybody would let Paul Warfield go was just stupid. I think Paul is, in my mind, uh, the greatest receiver ever to play the game. Probably the most graceful individual going down running a pass pattern. He was like an antelope. 
always in control of himself, meticulous in terms of what he wanted to accomplish. The productivity part of who Paul was was so great because whenever he was called upon to do his job, then that's exactly what he did. He caught 29 balls, but 10 for touchdowns. All of his plays that he did have were extremely important. The greatest move I've ever seen was Paul Warfield against Oakland in 1970. And he just did a pirouette with the grace and smoothness of a gazelle and just kept on down the field. We reversed, I think, a 3, 10, and 1 to go 10 and 4. And I think that just, just kindled the, the, the fire in this team's belly. Although we got beat in the first round of the playoffs, it was just a great turnaround. And, and our football team now gained the confidence that we could compete with anybody. And our fans now realize that we were one of the elite teams in the National Football League. In 1971, the Dolphins improved on their previous record to win the team's first division championship. The reward for their efforts? a late December all-expenses-paid trip to America's heartland. We had to go out to Kansas City on Christmas Day and try and beat these guys that were supposed to be in the Super Bowl. You know, we looked at it as we had nothing to lose and everything to gain. Uh, we played well all year, and we played well in that game. That game was a brutal football game, the longest game ever played. I lost like 18 pounds that day. I lost so much weight that my pants were loose. And they would not die. We kept trying to cut their head off, and we couldn't. And they tried to keep cutting our head off, and they couldn't. We just kept coming back at each other. Everything that you could ever want in a football game was there. And uh, I, I always joke, I said there were more burnt turkeys on that ball game uh, on that day than probably any other day in the history of the NFL. In a game that lasted a record 82 minutes and 40 seconds, it was a series of key play calls by the Dolphins that eventually ended the marathon. I knew we had it in the game plan, but I hadn't run it the whole ball game because that's all I heard the Chiefs looking for the whole game was, you know, watch the misdirection. So I didn't run it. And I almost forgot about it. Yes, we called a roll right, trap left, where all the action would go one way. It was like a counter move for him. I would pull from the backside and lead him through the hole, and that was a big play for us. Larry Zonka's 29-yard run put Miami within range for a field goal try from kicker Gero Yapremio. Here's the pass that down, the kick is up. He's got the distance. tease about Gary Premium getting all the credit, people running, picking him up, and I lost 18 pounds. I'm looking out my ear hole, my pants are falling off. But when he kicked that field goal, I got to kiss him, brother. I was so glad to get off that field. A week later, the Dolphins dethroned the reigning Super Bowl champions. On the strength of a 75-yard touchdown reception by Warfield, and arguably, the greatest single defensive play in team history. And I haven't have had an interception in the Orange Bowl that they had seven perfect blocks by our defense. Curtis Johnson tipped the ball and I caught it, started down the north sideline and cut across the field. And our defensive players were just knocking people down. You know, it was one of those once in a lifetime plays and, and experiences, and, you know, put us in the Super Bowl. Years later, Nick would say, geez, Dick, he said, you're so slow. I went out and got a hot dog and came back. You were still running. I said, well, that's because you, you're the only one that didn't make a block. We were very enthralled with our successes up to that point, but forgot that there was one game remaining on the schedule, the biggest game of them all. That's a lot to deal with, with a young team that just three years earlier, two years earlier to be exact, had never won more than four games in a year. The Dolphins were no match against a dominating Dallas team. And we were a little overwhelmed. I think we got panicky. 
and it made us look like jackasses. And we were embarrassed afterwards. Super Bowl VI pissed us off. You do one thing when you get humbled in a Super Bowl like that. You fall apart or you pull tighter together. I think Shula outlined that after the game in the locker room. The bitterness of that defeat, uh, that is from where the uh, resolve came that uh, we were going to get back to that game. And, uh, and when we did, the results were going to be different. Motivated by both the loss to Dallas and his own defeat in Super Bowl III, Don Shula led the Dolphins on a focused crusade to begin the 1972 season. Miami rode the hot hand of Bob Greasy in winning each of its first four games. But in week five against the Chargers, disaster struck. Shaken up on the play is Greasy. Yeah, it looks like his right ankle, Rick. Uh, it may be right here. He may have to go out of the ball game. When a team lost a top quarterback like Bob Greasy, everyone said, you know, it's over for them. They're not going to go anywhere. They may, they may not win another game. Stepping in to replace the fallen quarterback was his 38-year-old understudy. Well, I always say uh, Bob Greasy was a nice guy because he break, broke his ankle so I could play. Uh, I was just thinking, let's get a first down, let's get down the field and keep us more or less on an even keel. Morrow on the snap, drops straight back to throw. He sets up, he is firing down the corner, Warfield, touchdown! Earl drops to throw, he sets, he is firing the near side, fully open, touchdown! There's where the experience, the intestinal fortitude come in. Even as Morrow kept the offense on a steady course, it was Miami's defense that began dominating Dolphins games. You know, looking back at our film clips of our defense, you really appreciate all the more how good these players were and how good our scheme was under, you know, our defensive coaching staff. It was just fun to watch them because they didn't make mistakes. They didn't give up the big play. What they did do was acquire a nickname that would become part of NFL legend. The no-name defense became sort of symbolic of a defense that, with a, not a lot of known players, became a terrific defense to be on. And after a while, we kind of loved it. Matter of fact, we took a, a, uh, a photo of the entire defense where we all wore the uh, Lone Ranger masks, and they said, who are these masked men? The story that I remember is from Tom Landry uh, commenting on the defense of the Dolphins. He said, well, they have a pretty good defense. I don't know any of the names of the people playing on their defense, but they play good defense. To this day, I, I really, I live with the term no name, but I don't really like it. I always considered it a misnomer. This was a defense with a lot of big names and a lot of big players. The leader of the defense without question was, was Nick. Nick was the guy that uh, took charge. You know, um, Typical attorney. I was five foot eleven, looking up into the masks of six foot five guys, but not one of them ever said anything back to me. The mastermind behind the no names was Miami's crafty defensive coordinator. I think the key to our defense was Bill Arnsbarger. Our defensive coach was brilliant. He was a marvelous chess player. He had an ability to put our players in the right place at the right time. And so he called a defense that identified the ability of each player. The Miami Dolphin defense in those days was designed to help and to give help. Anderson and other stars such as Vern Den Herder, Tim Foley, and Jake Scott made critical plays throughout the 72 season. They were helped along by the advent of Arnsbarger's innovative strategy, the 53 defense. They call it the 53 defense, not because it had anything to do with the alignment. That was Bob Matheson's number. So it was very easy to remember. Instead of 53, all we had to do was look at Bob Matheson as he came into the lineup. We really stumbled onto it because of an injury. And when Matheson joined us, everybody was playing the same defense, except they had the man over the end with his hand down on the ground. We didn't see any reason to put Bob's hand down on the ground, so we just played the same defense that everybody else was playing, except we had Bob standing up. Offensive lines and, and offensive line coaches and offensive coordinators were totally confused because with Bob Matheson lining up, they didn't know whether he was going to drop back as a linebacker, come as a defensive player. Plus that, we had all kinds of blitzes working off that. 
That was kind of a different thing in 1972. They would give me the freedom to move at any of the four linebacker spots and blitz. That's one of those deals where you're ahead of the offense. They, uh, they had to catch up and, and find, figure out how to defense this. The Dolphins continued to roll through their schedule, paying virtually no attention to the history-making course they were charting. It was not until the 11th ball game of the year when we went in to play the New York Giants and the New York media started to focus in on the fact that we were undefeated, that it became an issue. Going undefeated just sort of happened. Um, you know, we didn't like losing football games, and, uh, you know, there wasn't really any pressure on us to go undefeated because it never happened before. Following their win over the Colts in the final week of the season, they became the first NFL team to finish its schedule at 14-0. And after beating the Browns in the first round of the playoffs, the Dolphins traveled to Pittsburgh for the title game. But early on against the Steelers, Miami looked anything but perfect. Offensively, we just didn't have anything going at all. We couldn't run the ball. We weren't throwing the ball very well or consistently. And it just happened a situation that preceded all that stuff. We were, I think, fourth and five or something like that. And we knew that Pittsburgh had a habit of peeling back and forming their wall to return the ball. And they had one rusher from the outside. He came up, everybody else hit and went to the wall, and there was a hole you and I both could have run through at the same time. And now he's going to run with the ball. 35 to the 30, down to the 25 to the 20. The Dolphins running on a fake hunt for Mason. Larry Stifle was the ball carrier, and he picked up a first down. Disciples gamble set up a Dolphin score, but the offense was still struggling at the close of the first half. Well, we weren't doing well in, in the ball game, and Earl Morrill had come in for Bob Greasy when Bob Greasy got injured in the uh, fifth game of the season, and Earl got us into that championship game. But Greasy had been healthy and had been practicing well for us for about a week or two. Don Shula had to make the decision, which great leaders have to make. And at halftime, uh, he told Earl, he says, Earl, I appreciated everything you've done to this point. He says, I'm going to make a decision to go with Bob in the second half. And it was short, it was sweet, and it was to the point. Gracie, the quarterback, ducks up, he fires the middle. Warfield's got it, 35, 40, 45, 50. Bob to the 40, 35 to the 30. He's back down from behind of the Steelers' 25-yard line. The Greasy to Warfield connection sparked the attack to a pair of second-half touchdown runs from Jim Kick, more than enough to send Miami back to the Super Bowl. Yet despite their 16-0 record, the Dolphins were still decisive underdogs going into Super Sunday. I'll never forget, in that perfect year, I was doing the Dolphins' locker room interviews, but we were underdogs. This was still how the AFL was regarded. We're unbeaten in the AFC. The Redskins have lost two or three games. We're playing them and their favorite. I drove with Jimmy Greek from Las Vegas to LA, and I said, Jimmy missed set the line. I said, Jimmy, how could the Redskins be favored? We're unbeaten. He said, yeah, you're the AFL. You're still the AFL. I said, yeah, but we had Namath in. You're still the AFL. Redskins played tougher competition. I said, you're making a mistake. We dominated that game. The no-name defense allowed no points, paced by 17 tackles from Manny Fernandez and two clutch interceptions from game MVP Jake Scott. With just minutes to go, the Dolphins looked to complete their coronation with the Yapremian field goal. What followed was the biggest blunder in Super Bowl history. I could have kicked the 42-yard field goal in my sleep. I ran out there, uh, lined up, the snap was perfect. I kicked the ball, line drive. I picked it up, I figured this is a negative. I'll take this and turn it into a positive. It is picked up by Gallo. He tries to throw a pass, deflected in the air. The ball slipped out of my hands. Mike Bass picked it up, went for a touchdown. Was I scared? Yes, I was. I tried to exit way by the goal line. And of all people, 
the guy who was in my face was Coach Shula. Now, Garrell uh, didn't come over to high-five me when that happened, I guarantee you. And uh, players on our sideline were very upset. You know, if there was a noose anywhere handy, I, I know of about 40 guys who were ready, willing, and able to string Garrow up. The no-name saved Garrow's hide with one final stand to cap off the greatest single-season performance by any NFL team ever. that we did win the big game and had the perfect season on top of it just took away all of that criticism of my coaching abilities. I had to feel good about that. And I also had to feel good about the accomplishments of, of our team, of doing something that no other team had ever done in, in the history of the National Football League. You know, winning all the games. Nobody had done it before that. Nobody's done it since then. This is the Vince Lombardi Trophy for the winner of the Super Bowl. 17-0 says it all. The World Championship. The best team ever in professional football. In 72, we were so determined to pay attention to detail, to win everything, to prove to ourselves that we could, that we did. In 73, we were probably a better football team. If nothing else, we were a better football team because we were more confident. We played the Oakland Raiders there in 1973. Our offense struggled against the Raiders that day. I believe we lost the game to like 12-7. Had we not lost that, that game, we would have went undefeated again. We would have went back-to-back -back undefeated seasons. So there's no question in my mind because the 73 team was better than the 72 team. The offense was not a flashy, big play type of offense. In fact, the offense was more of a type of offense that controlled the ball, monotonous, it was boring, we just ran right through everybody and just uh, marched down the field and scored, but it worked. You know, it was fun to us because we loved getting the ball on the 20-yard line, driving it down, 80 yards to score, and not throwing the ball with maybe one or two times. That made our job much more easy because uh, run block was easier than pass blocking. I enjoy locking the man back off the ball and putting him on his behind. That's where we got our thrills from, because we knew we couldn't get him the right in the other way. We never carried the ball. We never caught the ball. And that was an amazing feeling to know that when you run plays, there's nothing that you concern yourself with except making sure that you follow these guards and they will take you to the promised land. You have a quick trap up the middle, and uh, you'll be in the secondary shortly because these guys provided not holes, but hallways for you to run through. Mercury was the guy that could get things done quickly. He was the guy that had some pizzazz, and the other team knew it. In fact, when Mercury was having his good years, the other team would defense Mercury first and Zonka second as far as trying to stop our offensive running game because Mercury could hurt you big, and Zonka wasn't going to hurt you big. But uh, over a period of, of the game, Zonka was the one that kept pounding on them and kept their offense from getting on the field and scoring points. Larry Zonka was an absolute inspiration for our offensive line. Langer and I would have a standing bet as to which side of Larry Zonka's face his nose would be at at game's end because one play would come back and it's over here to the left and the next play would be over to the right and blood and snot and everything. But it was like having an offensive lineman in the backfield. Zonka had played an important but supporting role in Super Bowl VII. In Super Bowl VIII, he was the undisputed star of the show. We ran it down their throats. They didn't want to have to tackle Zonka because Zonka was on a roll in that game and he was doing things that really he was running through these people and they, there was no way that they could stop us. They could not stop the machine that we brought there. And they had a team, but we had a machine. Breezy takes the snap. It's Zonka straight up the middle. And Our offense.
offensive line um, did such a marvelous job in the coordination of their blocking. The job that Kuchenberg did on Allen Page just did a marvelous job the entire game. The holes were so large that Zonka went through without a hand on it. Zonk rushed for a Super Bowl record 145 yards. Now he hands off to Zonk, heading right side, touchdown, Larry Zonka! His second touchdown of the afternoon. And the Dolphins, if they hadn't already, have now established clear superiority in this game. With the victory and the championship assured, Shula paid tribute to several veterans by allowing them a curtain call. One of the great honors in my career was uh, at the end of Super Bowl VIII, Coach Shula called a few of us off. I went toward the bench, and Don Shula came over and gave me a big hug. That was the perfect ending to a, a nearly perfect day, and uh, seems like it was yesterday. With a second Lombardi trophy in the display case, Shula's Dolphins set their sights on a three-peat. But trouble loomed even before the start of the 74 season, when three of the team's biggest stars were being courted by a brand new rival football league. I think we were all more interested in staying with the Miami Dolphins rather than going to a new league. But we needed a bargaining chip or some leverage to, to deal with the Miami Dolphins. We were in a situation where we were making $50,000 a year, which was a good salary for the NFL back then and were offered an opportunity to make three and a half million dollars over two and a half years. That's why I left the Miami Dolphins. Larry at the time just came off the MVP and was certainly a big name and getting Paul Warfield, the greatest receiver ever, in my opinion, in the NFL. Uh, whether I was the caboose or not, I don't know, but it was something new for me and I like taking chances and adventurous things. Uh, Zonk called Coach Shula that, that day that we were going to sign and, uh, and more or less said we'd like to hear from uh, you know Joe Robbie one way or the other and we never received a phone call so. The phone rang and it was uh, <clears throat> their representative saying that unless Joe Robbie matched the offer that they were going to sign uh, in Canada. We banged back and forth in the end uh, I remember Shula saying to me what do you want me to do, get on my knees? And I felt terrible because I mean, I have the utmost respect for Shula. I mean, just a great, great person. I'm sitting there with, with uh, all of the dreams of, of what our team is capable of doing. And everything just looked like it was, uh, it was going to continue to get better. And then uh, out of the clear blue, I find out that three of our best football players are, are, are going to be gone and we're gonna get absolutely nothing back in return. It was tough to handle. The impact on the 74 Dolphins was catastrophic. I think because we knew Zonk Kick, Warfield were going to leave, we never hit our stride, never found that rhythm. Still a very good team, but it's just different when you know guys are going to be out the door at the end of the season. Despite lame duck players and nagging injuries, the Dolphins still won the AFC East and took a late lead in the divisional round game. But then, Miami fell victim to one of the most infamous plays in team history, Oakland's improbable sea of hands comeback. There he is, fading, looking, looking, looking. He's under the gun. He's tied, he throws. It is. It was a devastating moment, and especially infuriating to Manny Fernandez. Someone threw a, uh, a whiskey bottle and almost hit Warfield in the head. And, uh, and then uh, a Raider fan came on the field. As I was standing there, he came over and he punched me in the stomach. And Manny pummeled him to the ground. And if he wasn't pulled off, Manny would have killed him. I cried like a baby after that game, the most disappointing game of my life, because it did stop the dream, and we also knew that our team as we knew it wouldn't be the same anymore. 
Now, as a credit to Coach Shule and his staff, even without Zonka kicking Warfield, we still went 10-4 and four and 10-4 and four the following years and still flirted with the playoffs and so on and so forth, but we just weren't the same. New defensive stars emerged in tackling machine Steve Toll, number 56, and linebacker Larry Gordon, number 50. On offense, number 82, Duriel Harris, became a deadly aerial weapon. And on the ground, the Dolphins relied on the zigzag jaunts of Delvin Williams, number 24. While the late 70s teams failed to achieve the level of their Super Bowl predecessors, they did maintain perfection whenever playing their division rivals from Buffalo. What I remember about the 70 Bills teams is we owned them. I'm talking complete ownership. It was an annuity that did not stop paying. And I know it's painful for Buffalo Bills and fans, but through all the O.J. Simpson years, through all the electric company, through uh, Joe Ferguson and all their great wins, there was one thing they could never do. They could not beat the Miami Dolphins. I played for the Miami Dolphins for eight years, and I never lost to the Buffalo Bills. When we were playing the Bills, that was a victory that we counted on each and every year. Now, in the reverse, Buffalo was a team that so many negative things happened to them that whenever we played them, they would have a shot. They'd had a game won, and it's like they're waiting for something bad to happen and a reason to lose the ball game, and usually they did. Miami won a record 20 consecutive games against the Bills, with many of those wins crafted by a now bespectacled Bob Greasy. But Bob's best outing came on Thanksgiving Day in 1977, when he carved up the Cardinals with a team record six touchdown passes. Unfortunately, Greasy was finding it more difficult to avoid serious injuries. By the end of the 1980 season, the face of the franchise knew his time was done. When you're a quarterback, you hurt your shoulder. Seriously hurt it. And you're 36, 37 years old. Yeah, that's, you had a good, good uh, thought that that might be the last one. I never thought I was going to play in the National Football League, and I played 14 years, so I didn't get shortchanged at all. The Dolphins now look to the new decade and the second golden era under Don Shula. In 1981, the Dolphins replaced Bob Greasy with the quarterback tandem of number 10, Don Strock, and David Woodley, number 16. Woodley was the uh, starter and Strock was our relief pitcher. And they call it the Woodstrock uh, combination. David was an athlete trying to learn how to be a quarterback. And so Don Shula built a team around defense and around a great running game. And it was Woodley who was able to run that kind of an offense, to use deception, rollout patterns. Shula put in some plays for Woodley that you could never use for another quarterback. There was a halfback pass. Tony Nathan would throw the ball back to Woodley, and he scored him several plays. Woodley took more snaps, but when a different style was needed, Shula called on Strzok, an eight-year veteran. Don Strzok was a uh, very smart guy, a student of the game, uh, was like an assistant uh, coach or offensive coordinator on the sideline there. And the way that the Woodstock thing came up was when we fell behind early and you needed to throw the football, that's when Strzok became a viable option. He was the guy who'd come in and lead you back, who could get the uh, quick touchdown, who could throw for 400 yards in a ball game. You had to prepare for two different people. And I think it was a unique situation, and, and, uh, and Coach Shula was, uh, was a master at, at knowing when to insert myself, what situations, and that uh, uh, carried us for a period of time. Woodstock carried the Dolphins to an AFC East title and home field advantage in the first round of the playoffs. Woodley was ineffective and Miami trailed 24 to nothing after the first quarter. 
the Dolphins desperately needed to play catch-up. Shula went to the bullpen and called on his relief pitcher to throw touchdown strikes. You know at that point that it's a, it's a major decision to be made by the coaching staff to bring in your backup quarterback. But uh, we had seen Don in the past and knew what he was able to do throwing the football. And uh, fortunately for us, he came in, he started putting the ball up in the air and with, a, with a lot of success. Drives the quarterback, steps up, throws it in the end zone, it's complete. I tell y'all, we're going to come back. We're going to come back and whoop them. Miami's number one. Never give up on Miami. Never give up on the Shula team. Never give up on the Shula team. Halftime, I went in, and our team was so excited. I said, I'm not going to screw this up by trying to make a speech. I'm just going to let this excitement carry off uh, into the second half. Strzok passed for over 400 yards and four touchdowns in the game. His passing ignited a 38-31 lead before San Diego tied the score. Uwe von Schaman had potential game-winning field goals blocked on the last play of regulation time and again in overtime. Waiting for the ball, the snap, it's down, he hits it. It is blocked again. The Chargers block it. Looking for the ball, San Diego has it at the 16-yard line. The Chargers have blocked it again. San Diego finally secured a three-point victory in one of the decade's greatest games. I told him that I was very proud of him because when you lose a game like that and you know that your team, especially on a night that took so much out of you, has given it everything that they have to give, all, all you can do is compliment them for, for having the confidence and, and having the, the courage to stay in there the way that our football team stayed in there. It's a game in my coaching career that I think about as one of the great games. Unfortunately, you know, you'd like to have great games associated with wins. That was a great game that we lost. Every game is an opportunity to learn something, not about yourself, but about your team and your teammates. I look at that game as a launching pad for what was to come the following year. In 1982, all the buzz was about a defense known as the Killer Bees. The Killer Bees! The Dolphins are number one. We got defense! Why the nickname? Because the unit featured number 73, Bob Baumhauer, Doug Betters, number 58, Kim Bocamper, number 59, Bob Brodzinski, and the Blackwood brothers, Lyle number 42, and Glenn number 47. We communicated well. I think we had a group of guys who liked to study the game of football. With, with Bill Arnsbarger, he gave us the freedom to make changes out there, that was fun. That was enjoyable because it allowed you to use your head, your creativity, and we had a sharp, intelligent group of football players that uh, happened to be good athletes as well. The Bees were killer in more than just name only. This swarming defense stung opponents. In the strike-shortened 1982 season, Miami boasted the NFL's top-ranked defense. In the AFC Championship game, the soggy conditions were ideal for the Killer Bees. Three interceptions by A.J. Dewey included a 35-yard touchdown. It was the first AFC Championship game shutout since the Dolphins blanked Baltimore in 1971. In Super Bowl 17, the Dolphins jumped out to a first quarter lead when David Woodley and Jimmy Cephalo combined for a 76-yard touchdown pass. 
Another big play enabled Miami to assume a 17-10 second quarter advantage. Bolton Walker's 98-yard kickoff return was the first kickoff to be returned for a touchdown in Super Bowl history. But ultimately, the Killer Bees were worn down by Washington's massive offensive front line. John Reagan's 43-yard touchdown in the fourth quarter gave the Redskins a lead they never relinquished. Still, the main reason for the Dolphins' return to the Super Bowl had been defense. The Dolphins dramatically changed direction in 1983 when they made quarterback Dan Marino the 27th pick of the NFL draft. Now we had Dan Marino ranked number two right behind Elway. Elway was number one. Dan had a great junior year at Pittsburgh and then his senior year wasn't quite as good. And I think that's why he fell way back in the first round in the draft. We were very, very happy when he slid to us to the 27th pick in the first round. It was fortunate for me because I came in and I was able to play early, but I had a lot of help from, from the veterans and the people that were here. The thing I really liked about him was that he asked questions from sun up till sundown. And uh, one thing that I told him was, try to learn something new every day. Not only about football, but about life itself. And uh, you can only improve as a person and a player. Marino's first start marked the end of Woodstruck and the beginning of a new era in franchise history. Here's the snap. Marino drops the throw. Has time. Going deep up the sideline. Man down. Got it. 30, 25, 20. Duplo, they'll never catch him. Touchdown. Marino threw for 322 yards and three touchdowns in an overtime loss to the Bills. The rookie went on to win the AFC passing title, and the Dolphins won the AFC East. He's a lot like Bonacani was as a linebacker. It didn't take long for the thought to go from the mind to the feet. With Marino, it doesn't take long for the thought to go from the mind to the arm to the feet, whatever it takes to evade the rush and let go of the football. Well, that second year, 1984, was just, you know, one of the great memories of my coaching career when he threw 48 touchdown passes and uh, defenses didn't know what to do against Dan. They didn't know how to figure it out. They tried to blitz him and we would beat the blitz and then they'd lay back in coverage and we'd beat the coverage and, uh, you know, we had all of the answers. Throughout the 1980s, the Dolphins' dazzling array of offensive weapons enabled Marino to ascend to pro football's pantheon. I'm not the type of person who's going to stand there and tell you how good I am. I think I'm confident in what I do as a player, as a quarterback. You have to have confidence in yourself that you can do the job and that everybody around you can help you do your job. Future Hall of Famer Dwight Stevenson helped make Dan Marino one of the NFL's best protected quarterbacks. I've never seen a player in the NFL dominate a position the way Dwight Stevenson dominated his position of center for the Miami Dolphins. What he did was he redefined the way offensive linemen blocked defensive players. He used his hands, he was 260 pounds, not an overly large individual. Incredibly quick, incredibly strong. Dwight had a great ability for knowing when you were off balance. Opposing defenders were kept off balance as the offensive line gave Marino plenty of time to connect with an outstanding receiving core. It was my senior year where he was playing in pit, and we came out for pregame, and they were down there throwing, and we were down there throwing. And I was just watching him throw. I was like, God, if I could get on the same team with him in the pros. <laughs> I'd hold Marino to Clayton as uh, worthy of consideration amongst the great combos of all time. Back to throw, Marino, here's a deep pattern down the far corner. It is Tim Buck, touchdown, great reception by Mark Clayton. Holy Toledo. Clayton was uh, an extraordinary athlete and receiver. The first thing I heard about Clayton was that he used to 
earned some extra money in college by betting people that he could leap a pool table lengthwise. He had that kind of ability. He could leap better than anybody ever been around. Great speed and quickness. And he was also a very tough receiver. Clayton and speed burner Mark Duper, number 85, were known as the Marx Brothers. But there was nothing comical about the way they torched opposing secondaries. Duper had uh, twin rockets strapped to his fanny. I mean, he could get down there. Uh, he was a sprinter in college. I'll tell you, when Duper gets in behind anybody, it's Katie by the door. He runs the 40 and 425, was a member of that Northwestern Louisiana State NCAA National Champion 440-yard relay team a couple of years ago. Mark Clayton and Mark Duper were outstanding. They were unstoppable. That was quite an arsenal Marino had to work with. You had Tony Nathan that was a major contributor. Bruce Hardy, the tight end, probably the best tight end in Dolphin history. Nat Moore was still skilled as both a slot receiver and coming out of the backfield. Nat Moore is very unheralded in my mind. To me, Nat Moore is the greatest receiver that's ever played for the Dolphins. Uh, people talk about Paul Warfield and they talk about the Marx Brothers, and those are great players, and I love being teammates of all of them. But to me, Nat Moore was the most well-rounded receiver the Dolphins have ever had. In 1984, Marino and a high-scoring offense propelled the 14-2 Dolphins into the AFC Championship game. The league's most valuable player passed for over 400 yards and four touchdowns. He drops quickly to throw, looks right across the middle. He's got Clayton open, 10, 5, touchdown, Dolphins! Weak side out, two. Tackle by number 95, John Goodman. Red right, 70 flanker right. Three up. Go, Diddy! Diddy! Six points! Diddy! Diddy, come on, Diddy! Again out of the shotgun, Marino. Deep drop, throwing deep upfield down the near side, man open, touchdown! The Dolphins won the right to play in Super Bowl 19, the team that had set an NFL regular season record by scoring 513 points was heavily favored to beat the 49ers. Miami scored first, but Marino's usually stalwart pass protection broke down against the San Francisco pass rush. Marino's NFL future would include many great achievements, but he never returned to a Super Bowl. In 1985 and 1986, Marino threw for 74 more touchdowns, and in 85, he practically willed Miami to an AFC East title. The Dolphins won their last seven regular season games, including a Monday night matchup against the 12-0 Bears. They were undefeated and they had a chance of breaking the Dolphins record. Uh, and it was Monday night football and, and the hype, the Orange Bowl, which is a great place to play. You could just feel the electricity in the stands. The people were there early and you could feel the buzz, the excitement. It was up to the 85 Dolphins and their fanatic fans to ensure that the 1972 team's legacy of perfection stayed intact. I don't think I've ever heard it that loud in a football game. And uh, the beauty of the Orange Bowl is that the crowd's right on top of you. And uh, I think the fans were probably more aware of, of the perfect season record than, than even the players thought about. Marino neutralized the NFL's most fearsome defense, and the Dolphins posted an impressive victory on their way to another AFC East title. Ball is deflected in the air. This would be the last meaningful NFL game in the Orange Bowl. In 1986, the Bulls' final year as the Dolphins' home, Miami finished with an 8-8 eight eight record.
1987 saw the Dolphins move into Joe Robbie Stadium. But during the first three seasons in its new home, the team struggled. From 1987 through 1989, the Dolphins lost more games than they won. This is the last play. Dolphins lead 24 to 20. There won't be time for anything else. Here's the snap. He's going to run for the football. He gets in for the score. The Bills win it. Tough loss for Miami. Toughest I've ever seen. It really is. I mean, to lose a game that way. But by 1990, a turnaround was underway. Miami started the season with an 8-1 record and would go on to earn a wild card berth. A revitalized defense helped carve out a path to the playoffs. Linebacker John Offerdahl earned first team all pro honors. Offerdahl, a five-time Pro Bowl selection during his Dolphin career, terrorized running backs. Jeff Cross, number 91, led a pass rush that was among the AFC's best during 1990. Safety Lewis Oliver led the team in interceptions from 1989 through 92. His 103-yard touchdown return against the Bills set a franchise record. Although the defensive resurgence of 1990 turned out to be fleeting, 1991 saw the return of Marino Magic. 62, blood orange, 62, tight end short. Got it. Yeah, got it. From, uh, from uh, orange? Underneath, yeah. Marino was voted to the Pro Bowl after a three-year absence, then was selected again in 1992 as he led Miami to the AFC Championship game. In 1993, Marino threw eight touchdown passes as the team jumped out to a 4 and one record. But in a Week 5 win over Cleveland, Marino injured his Achilles tendon and was sidelined for the remainder of the season. There were some questions about uh, would Danny be able to come back? You know, at that time, Achilles tears uh, were not repaired with the certainty that they are today. And then there was the fact that the Achilles was not repaired properly. And he had a terrible uh, training camp, and he had, uh, was terrible through the preseason games. And uh, the detractors were out there in masses. And there was a young kid, Scott Mitchell, the new hot shot on the scene. He had replaced Danny when he went down in 93, and he played very well. And there were some out there saying, hey, it's time. Let's go with, with the new kid. And all this negativity was swirling. And Marino put on one of the all-time performances. He was incandescent. Marino slogging in the mud, back to pass. He throws downfield, has a man open. Mark Ingram has it at the 30. He's to the 20, 10. He is gone. Oh, touchdown! Die. Third down, 15 to go. Gigantic play for the Dolphins here. He's looking, has time, throws into the end zone. Keith Jackson has it. Touchdown, Dolphins. Oh, yes! Marino is back, baby! He's got Fryer wide. Courage. You talk about a will to win. Bledsoe, to his credit, was matching Marino blow for blow. It was touchdown, exchange, exchange. And it came down to Marino with the ball in his hands, last possession. It was fourth and six. And fourth and six, you're thinking, let's get the first down. Let's keep this thing going. There's some time left. Not Marino. Marino drops back, and he does a down, out, and up, which Marino lays right on Irving Fryer's fingertips. Touchdown, Miami. Miami wins the ball game, one of the great shootouts of all time. And uh, once again, Marino proves his detractors wrong. Shotgun, Marino throws deep downfield. It is caught by Fryer. Yeah! Inside that man, Dan Marino. 
first of all, he, Danny's a winner, and he loved to compete, and he loved to win. I think he proved to himself, hey, I've still got the magic. I think everybody, every, you know, athlete has been successful, has a certain intangible inside him that he can call on, whatever it is that what he needs. And I've always had the attitude just not to quit. And then I could, you know, I can overcome anything in a, in a football situation, in a game situation. And, and as, as you prove that as time goes on, you get more confidence. Never out of the game with Marino. That's the thing I loved about Dan. Excitement. Our fans knew it. Our players knew it. Dan knew it. The coaching staff knew it, that uh, no matter what the score was, that we were always in the game. 49 seconds, one timeout remaining. They trail by three. The whole season, perhaps, is balanced here. Here is Marino back to throw. He's going deep. Got a man down there. He's got a touchdown! Oh, oh, oh! During his career, Marino led 36 comeback drives in the fourth quarter or in overtime. Marino's most classic comeback came in 94 when he rallied the Dolphins from a 10-point deficit. He threw two touchdown passes with 4-12 remaining and was a master of deception on the game winner. With 32, 31, 30 seconds to go, I believe Marino is saying I'm going to spike it. Takes the snap from center. He's looking. He throws. Oh, right. Touchdown, Dolphins. Mark Ingram. That was oh, unbelievable. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, you like that, Paul. They caught the Jets off guard on that play. The Jets are, you know, they're sleepwalking. They, they're clueless. They have no idea what's going on. Mark Ingram runs a little down and out. Danny Boyd puts it right there. Game over. The important thing is uh, the last couple of ball games have been heartbreaking losses. And, Today was a great win, all right. 1995 was Marino's milestone season as he secured his status as one of the NFL's all-time greatest quarterbacks. Dan Marino becomes the all-time leader in pass completions in NFL history, and before this season is over, he will own every record known to man. Dan Marino, with that touchdown, has broken another record. He has the granddaddy of them all now. Most touchdown passes ever. They say football is all about the thumper, baby. <laughs> and he's got one as big as a football. In 1994, the family of the late Joe Robbie sold their majority interest in the Dolphins to H. Wayne Huizenga. Hey. One of Huizinga's first and most important decisions was to retain Don Shula as head coach. You can't look at Don Shula and say he didn't have the gift, the gift of leadership. I mean, the ability to inspire and make others believe. And that's why he had such great success. I mean, that's why he piled up 347 wins in the NFL. It's hard to feel like you're blocking that guy right here. You're getting your release, you're right here. He wasn't just good at one thing of leadership. He had the whole spectrum. Coaching is, is taking the, the uh, personnel that you have and getting the most out of their abilities. And I've always taken a great deal of pride in, in being able to do that. Regardless of what talent we had, Coach Shula found a way to bring the most out of everybody and to utilize our offense and defense to that talent. we got to make our own fire, baby. we got to make our own fire. we got to hang together, support each other. When they make a play, just hang in there, and then we make the plays to win the football game. Let's do it, baby. Our day. Let's go. All right. Defense, take away. I, I never felt you had the game won until the game was over. And uh, so I was always up tight on the sideline until that final whistle. Because you don't ever want to be the coach that lets something slip away that should have never slipped away if you would have done your job as a coach. This Hall of Famer was literally a coach for all seasons. Sunbaked Miami could also be rain-soaked Miami. And Shula's teams often had to slog it out in the mud. Some of Shula's weirdest football experiences came in the snow. 
In Foxborough, the dolphins weren't outmuscled by men. They were outmaneuvered by a machine. In this case, the machine was a snowplow. The snowplow game, you know, that brings back a lot of bad memories. <laughs> and, and I'll never forget, it snowed so hard that the field was completely covered. You couldn't see the lines. You didn't know where the sidelines were, and you didn't know where the lines across the field were. Such conditions precluded a blizzard of points. For most of the game, the scoreboard was frozen on zero. The score was 0-0. Zero, zero. No, neither team could do anything offensively. And they got down in position to kick a field goal, and Ron Meyer now realized that they had no chance of kicking the field goal unless the field was plowed out where the, the holder could catch the ball and put it down in an area where there, there wasn't any snow. The snow plow was driven by a convict on work release. and uh, He listened to everything that Ron Meyer, the coach, said. So he directed this convict on work release that was driving the snow plow out to where he wanted it plowed. It was really an unfair act when you come to think about it. They get the snap, they put it down, he kicks the field goal, it's good. It's the first time since I've been in professional football we've ever taken such serious exception to something which happened on the field. And th that kind of thing should not occur as a result of somebody putting a snow plow run by a convict with a day off from prison. He's a hero now, that convict on work release. And uh, just re recently, I went to a banquet up there, and they gave me a mini miniature snowflower for, for me to remember. The, and it was snowing the day that I went to the banquet. <laughs> the Dolphins right now put Stoyo on the field. Mr. Money. About a 39-yard field goal attempt. 15 seconds on the board. Peterson to hold. Here's the snap set down. It's blocked. Never did get it up in the air. Never did get it up in the air. The ball rolls free. Rolls free in the end zone. The Dolphins fall on top of it after it was touched by a Dallas player, and Miami is arguing. How about that? Now let's see what the officials are going to call it. With three seconds, the clock is stopped on the board. I remember uh, Jimmy Johnson and Jerry Jones starting across the field to give me their condolences on the other side. And all of a sudden, play is stopped, and they say, hey, wait a minute, there's time for one more play because Leon let touch the ball, and then, you know, we, we've downed it. So now we have one play. All right, waiting to snap is Peterson. Here it is, he sets it down, kick is up. It's good, and the Dolphins win the ball game. Yes, the Dolphins sir! win 16 to 14. Oh, right. Holy Toledo. All right, all right. In 1993, Don Shula became the winningest head coach in NFL history. What'd you do? Did you look for the eye and the look first on the 63 arrow? No. You looked right away. Right now, the guy was coming right in my face. Almost more. What's your name? 63. Let's be patient. Oh, now we gotta, oh, be, we gotta be patient. Take what we get. Mitchell looks into the middle, steps into the pocket. He throws the end zone. Man open, touchdown. This is number 325, and it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Coach Shula being mobbed as he becomes the all-time winningest coach in the history of the National Football League, breaking the record of the immortal George Hallis. Coach, coach. Good, Danny. Thank you. From every player on the team, and this is going to be a, a bronze sculpture with this the last ball of the field being on top. Thank you, John. Right. Hey. Two years later, the man who symbolized Dolphins football retired from coaching. I finally made the decision to step aside because I felt that, that I, you know, I wasn't doing as good a job as I felt that I should be doing. I had set the bar pretty high early in my coaching career, and, uh, you know, with the back-to-back -back Super Bowl wins and uh, six Super Bowl appearances and then not being in the, the big game for a period of time, I think that was disturbing to me. And then also knowing that we just hadn't done as well as I would like to think that we should have done. 
I had coached for 33 years. I was very proud of my record, my accomplishments, but perhaps somebody could come in and do a better job. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the next head coach of the Miami Dolphins, Jimmy. Following Don Shula's retirement, owner Wayne Huizinga turned to Jimmy Johnson. Wonderful. Still on. Still on. Come yeah. up with the check, man. Oh. Signing a four-year contract worth $8 million, Johnson became the NFL's highest paid coach. Well, you know, you know how my eyes close when I really smile big? And you lit up, too. <laughs> well, it's indeed a pleasure for me to be back in South Florida to be the head coach of an organization that I have admired for quite some time, uh, an organization that I think is at the very best in the NFL, and, and that's the reason I'm in here. The owner of a national championship and two Super Bowl rings, Johnson brought high expectations to the Dolphins. I think the biggest thing with uh, the football team right now is we want to establish an attitude that we're going to be the very best. Uh, and I know from day one that's not going to be the case. But as time goes on, I think that attitude will creep in that we will be the best. A strict taskmaster, Johnson began to reshape the Dolphins. Dominate that line of scrimmage. Dominate the line of scrimmage. Let's go. Go ahead, wrap his ass up and strip the ball down. Let's go. Sure tackle. Him. Coach Johnson stressed from the day he got the job, we're going to work. We're going to be the hardest working team in the NFL, and I can't believe there's a team out there working harder than we are right now. It's a hard camp, but it's a camp that's going to make you a better person, a better player. Sometimes I feel like I'm in that movie uh, Full Metal Jacket, the way uh, the way we screaming and going on out there. Discipline, discipline. You're going to be disciplined enough to stay on side. Discipline. Let's go. We always have physical training camps. We always have a lot of hard work and. I think it makes us uh, steel hardened for the season. Early in camp, Johnson found out just how good Dan Marino really was. All right, let's go, let's go. Play with some urgency now. A little urgency. Z, Z, flex on two. Ready? Set hot! Hot! <laughs> good job, good job. Good job, Eddie. Just fade stop over there hey, with the combination. I ain't never stop. been part of this where you can take it down the field that fast. Yeah. No. <laughs> nice job. Nice job. With Marino leading the offense, the Dolphins reached the playoffs in Johnson's second season. Lobbing one into the end zone. Barnett, touchdown. Fred Barnett leaps. He's got it. Hell of a job throwing that football. And Marino. With the offense in good hands, Johnson turned his attention to the defense, where an undersized linebacker caught his eye. His name, Zach Thomas. We drafted Zach uh, there in the fifth round, and we felt like really that he would uh, help us as a backup linebacker, be a, a great special teams player. And we went to the very first mini camp and went through a couple of practices and said, hey, watching the instincts of this linebacker and watching him move around the way he plays, uh, I can tell you right now, he's going to start for us. The Dolphins' starting middle linebacker on opening day, Thomas made an immediate impact. First game, I was so high, and I finally made it. And uh, that's when I was just happy to be here, and I just went out there and had some fun. Number 54 became a force in the middle of the Dolphins' defense, leading the team in tackles as a rookie. I guess what catches your eye is that... Uh, He's always at the ball. I mean, here's a guy that uh, not tall enough, not fast enough, but they just make plays. Very smart, instinctive player. Thomas bore a striking similarity to a Dolphin legend. I love the way uh, he pursues and chases. It jumped out on everybody. It looked like Nick Benacani. I can remember watching Nick. Every time he made a play, everybody said, you know, he was too small. The same with this guy, he's too short. Thomas's toughness could be attributed to an early childhood experience. I was playing on the back of a tire and uh, with a toy, and uh, it was parked, and the guy got in it, went back, ran me over once, and then pang, and like, ran me over twice, you know, went forward over me. But uh, that's when my dad, he said, you know, I knew we were going to be a football player because you could take a hit. During his 12-year career with the Dolphins, 
Thomas gave more hits than he took. He led the Dolphins in tackles an unprecedented 10 times. The former Texas Tech standout simply had an eye for the ball. During his career, Thomas picked off 17 passes, and his four interception returns for scores are a Dolphin record. It's intercepted! Thomas! 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 It's a touchdown! And here is O'Donnell, looking to throw, has time, now throws over the middle, picked off by Zach Thomas. He's got to go in! Touchdown Miami! And Zach Thomas now is the all-time Dolphin leader in interception returns for touchdown. How sweet it is! The pass rush got a boost in 1997 with the addition of third round pick Jason Taylor, number 99. Jason Taylor is a player that uh, it really you know, took everybody's eye right off the bat. He's got great quickness, he's a very intelligent player. He's an outstanding pass rusher and you just don't find natural pass rushers that often. With Taylor and Thomas wreaking havoc, the Dolphins' defense was the league's best in 1998. The unit surrendered a league low 265 points. Zach Thomas steps in front of a Cordell Stewart pass, makes a beautiful interception, and he's untouched into the end zone. We gotta have it now. We gotta have it. Dominate on three. Dominate on three. Make play. One, two, three. Dominate. On Monday night in week 16 against the eventual world champion Denver Broncos, the defense asserted itself. The unit held Denver to just over 200 yards. It is intercepted by Sam Madison. The Dolphin defense rises to the occasion. They take the football away. They intercept John Elway. And right now, the Dolphins have a chance to take total control of this football game. Against the Broncos, Marino was at his best, throwing for 355 yards and four touchdowns. Dan fakes the pitch. He's looking to throw. Fires deep down the near side. Lamar Thomas is open. Makes the catch at the 25. He's to the 15, the 10. Touchdown, Miami. Dan looking to throw. Firing Lamar Thomas's way. He makes the catch. It's a touchdown, Miami. Dan is back, he's looking, throws underneath the run against him. He's a touchdown Miami! He dragged Torrey James into the end zone. Four touchdown passes for Dan Marino. The victory earned the Dolphins their first home playoff game since 1994. In the wild card round against the rival Buffalo Bills, the defense quickly set the tone. Buffalo ball carriers were swarmed by Dolphin defenders. The opportunistic unit forced five turnovers. and the offense produced big plays of their own. Here we go. Marino back to pass. Fires over the middle. It's ball. It's a touchdown. Lamar Thomas has the ball. Late in the game, the defense needed one last stop to seal the victory. Thurman Thomas in the backfield with him. Flutie back, pumps once, now looking. He's hit by Trace Armstrong. And the ball! The ball runs! Dolphins have it at the three-yard line. Trace Armstrong with a sack, and the Dolphins are going to beat the Bills here at the Pro. The following year, roles were reversed. Late in the game, the Dolphins needed a touchdown to win. The master was up to the task. Third 
Third down and 17 now for the Dolphins from their own nine-yard line. Three-man rush by Seattle. Dan looks, he fires far side, and a great catch is made at the 32-yard line. Awesome! Simply awesome! First down Miami at the five-yard line. We'll win this game. Formation in the backfield. J.K. Johnson taking the pitch. He cuts. He goes. He All goes. right! Touchdown, Miami! The win was Marino's last as a Dolphin and was a fitting way to end his illustrious career. When he retired, Marino held every major passing record, a legacy few would ever approach. Going on the slant, complete to McDuffie at the goal line. He's in! Touchdown, Dolphins! And that is also career touchdown pass number 400 for Dan Marino. Physically the greatest quarterback ever to play the game. Uh, no one can throw the ball like Dan Marino. Dan was a great competitor, and he hated to lose. You know, he wanted to win. He wanted to win on every pass that he threw. He wanted to win every series that he was in. He wanted to win any, any game that he was part of. I got him as one of the greatest quarterbacks ever in the NFL. In 2000, the Dolphins retired Marino's number 13. I'd like to introduce to you my father, my hero, and my friend, ladies and gentlemen, Dan Marino. In 2005, Marino received the ultimate honor, enshrinement into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Last January, when I was elected to the Hall of Fame, I challenged all Dolphin fans to overrun Canton, Ohio. And you know what? We've taken it over. Thank you. The new millennium brought new faces to the Dolphins. Dave Wanstead replaced the retired Jimmy Johnson as head coach. We better not have any drops doing this. I could bring my daughter out here and go through this drill. We're installing a new offense this year, so there's going to be some changes, but, but that's good. And I think that urgency and competitiveness usually brings out the best in people. Competition brought out the best in quarterback Jay Fiedler as he earned the starting job. A Dartmouth grad, Fiedler made the most of the opportunity. Using his superior intelligence and leadership skills, number nine kept the Dolphins on the winning track. During his four-year stint as starter, Fiedler posted the third best winning percentage among NFL quarterbacks. Touchdown! A heavenly throw by Jay Fiedler. I'll give you this, but I'll tell you in the huddle, it'll be a nine pump. Okay. You stay with your six nine stop. Throwing deep left sideline, and it is caught. Touchdown! Right on target was Jay Fiedler. Few could question Fiedler's toughness. Taking hits from opponents as well as his critics, Fiedler stood tall. Jay Fiedler going, filling in for Dan Marino and filling those shoes. There's always going to be the comparison to the great Hall of Fame quarterback. History has shown us that it, it is literally impossible to fill the shoes. Marino, he was not. But Fiedler kept the Dolphins' offense moving and the team winning in 2000 into the end zone far side a leaping grab and it's a touchdown Miami touchdown Dolphins aiding Fiedler was a ferocious defense led by ends Trace Armstrong and Jason Taylor the furious pass rush resulted in a league high 28 interceptions game right here. Just go out there and lay it on the line and have some fun, fellas. Have lay some fun it on today. The line. By the season's final week, all that separated the Dolphins from their first division title since 1994 were the rival New England Patriots. The Dolphins would not be denied. 
handoff. Lamar Smith to the left side. He's hit, breaks the tackle. He's in for a touchdown. Touchdown, Miami. Hey, got to go back. Got to get another turnover. Here's Bledsoe, short drop, looking to throw. Fires over the middle and is tipped and picked off. Zach Thomas delivered a Christmas present. The Dolphins have it back. Say it with me. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. The kick is away. It has the distance. It is good. Olindo Mare. 49 yards. The Dolphins take the lead. That's what I'm talking about, baby. That's clutch right there. Olindo Mare, you are the man. <laughs> hey, we division champs. There's not a greater feeling in the world, not a greater feeling in the world to go out there with our backs to the wall and have to fight back and lay it on the line and leave it on the field and come out with a damn victory. Hey, hey, division champs, okay? Do or die. Let's do this. Hey, we don't get it done today. We're going home. We don't want to go home. Winner, go home, baby. Winner, go home. Trailing by 14 in the third quarter, the Dolphins needed a spark. The pyro, the bend, and the press the inverted wing, okay? You, you gotta put a little hiding. You gotta beat that guy's ass now, okay? The defense ignited a rally that would become part of Dolphin legend. A punishing ground attack led by running back Lamar Smith began to wear down the Colts' defense. Hand off Lamar to the left side. He's in! Touchdown Miami! And how fitting Lamar Smith would finish off this drive. Smith totaled over 200 yards on the ground. His 40th and final carry of the day made history. Can the Dolphins do it? It has been magical. It has been enchanted in the second half for Miami. Hand off, Lamar wrapping up the ball with both arms, and he just gets away from everybody. Look at this! Look at this! Look at this! because, hey, there, there's nothing that can be said to make anything happen like that. You know where that comes from? That comes from, that comes from the team. Hey, that comes from the damn heart. The following year, the defense carried the Dolphins to the playoffs. But an early exit prompted changes. Looking to improve his team's 23rd ranked rushing attack, Dave Wanstead worked a deal to bring Ricky Williams to the Dolphins in 2002. Hit that hole, Rick! Hit it there, hole! The draw to Ricky, looking for room, finds it at the 50. Ricky to the 45. Ricky to the 40. There he goes! First down and a lot more, he could go. There he goes. Bye, Ricky. Look at the Bills in your rear mirror. Touchdown, Dolphins. It is Williams slips away from one. Touchdown. Williams quickly earned a place in the hearts of Dolphins fans. Do not be fooled by the hairstyle. Ricky is, is probably one of the most intelligent uh, and well aware of football players that I've ever coached. You know, they think because he's a fairly aloof guy or has been, that he doesn't really like what he's doing. I think he loves what he's doing. It's just that when it's over, he doesn't love talking about it too much. If you could sit down in a room full of fans, mm -hmm. what would you want them to know about you? About me? About you. Just how much I love football and how much I respect the game. I've not seen a player reinvent himself as well as Ricky Williams, dropping the weight 
to become so much quicker. That determination, that attitude that every running play is he's trying to go the distance. A jaw-dropping, eye-popping kind of run by Ricky Williams. For two years, Williams ran with reckless abandon, totaling over 3,200 yards rushing and 25 touchdowns. I love contact, and I want to let them know that I'm going to be here the whole game. But the hits began to take a toll, and a worn-out Williams abruptly retired prior to the start of the 2004 season. Ricky would return in 2005, but the franchise fell on tough times. Coaches came and went as the team posted just one winning season over the next four years. The Dolphins hit rock bottom in 2007 when they won just one game. The worst team in the history of professional football. Why were they bad? Uh, untalented, uh, poorly coached, uh, not together, in complete disarray and utter embarrassment to, to the league and to the Miami Dolphins. The team's lone moment of glory came in overtime versus the Ravens. Got time, over the middle, Camarillo's got it! A bright spot during this dark time was the play of Jason Taylor. <laughs> A six-time Pro Bowl selection and NFL Defensive Player of the Year in 2006, Taylor is the Dolphins' all-time leader in sacks. And he's oh. stripped of the football. Jason Taylor's he got to be gone. He picked it up. At the 30, oh, Jay, at the 40, he may go the distance. Jason Taylor's going to score a touchdown. Get to the end zone. <laughs> touchdown, Jason Taylor. That's been the one constant for this Dolphin team, even through some losing years and years of struggle. That defense has been good. Why has that defense been good? One of the main reasons, Jason Taylor. I and mean, that's what Jimmy Johnson saw to him when he drafted him out of Akron. Uh, it was a guy who was more than just a pass rusher. He was a football player. Once I get in my stance, that's when I start to you know, think about what I'm gonna do to him. He doesn't believe that just because a tackle outweighs him by 70 pounds, that he can't beat this guy even with a bull rush he will force a tackle to do something that the tackle doesn't want to do realizes he's doing it and watches taylor go by if you have 15 sacks and you know you're the because one of the best in the league i mean you think about it, it's only 15 times you're tackling a quarterback out of all the plays during a season out of the thousand plays you take during the season so i mean it's so hard to get once you get back and get him on the ground it's it's, it's probably the best feeling in the world when you look back at this era of pro football he will be the guy who you could hold up as the greatest combination pass rusher and undersized player against the run of everybody. He'll be a guy who six, seven, eight years will be a very, very interesting debate for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He's in trouble and he's gonna go down. Jason Taylor, the sack play. for the safety. Looking to revive his franchise after a 1-15 in season, owner Wayne Huizinga turned to Bill Parcells. Renowned for his ability to resurrect struggling teams, Parcells was hired to head up Miami's football operations. I'm very, very pleased to be here in Miami with an organization that has the uh, history that the Dolphins have and to be working for a guy like Wayne Huizinga. Parcells hired no-nonsense Tony Sperano to be head coach. Buckle them chin straps, prima donnas! Not every period needs to take freaking 40 seconds to get started. Let's go! But turning around a 1-15 team 
would require thinking outside the box. We're 0-2. We had just gotten blasted by Arizona. Our offense wasn't doing much. So I'm up for anything. You know, being 0-2, you don't want to go 0-3. We had the New England Patriots next. We were overwhelming underdogs. And quite frankly, even though I colorized the game for the Dolphins, I'm thinking, we don't really have a snowball's chance in this game. And when they came in uh, to the meeting room with the Wildcat idea, uh, you know, it was a chance for us to give us a different look, give us a little spark. Ronnie will play the tail by Pennington, his flank to the left. They're going to they're gonna snap this back to Ronnie Brown. They hand it to Ricky you know, Nolan. Oh, yeah! Oh, no, 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 no. The triple option comes to the NFL. The Dolphins introduced a Wildcat offense um, with Ronnie Brown taking the direct snap from center. Yeah, and Ronnie Brown will take a direct snap. Run to the right. Oh, yeah! The genius, uh, the mastermind himself, Bill Belichick, had no idea what to do. They could not stop Ronnie Brown. Ronnie Brown was running the football successfully. He was uh, throwing the football successfully. Once again, Rex, after Ronnie Brown, goes to the right. Yes! He's got it! Are you kidding me? The New England Patriots have no idea what hit him. The New England Patriots looked like a midget league team stumbled down the field against the big boys. And what a sight to behold. Direction after Ronnie, Ronnie, right side, breaks the tackle, oh, he's, he's gone! He's at the 40, the 30! Ronnie Brown is fourth rushing oh. touchdown today! The Dolphins and the Wildcat took the NFL by storm. Wildcat. Wildcat, that's our, that's our playbook now. Wildcat personnel. Ronnie will take the right snap. Hands it again. Up the middle is Ricky Williams, and he's gone! The Wildcat brought a new dimension to the offense, as did newly acquired quarterback Chad Pennington. The football god smiled on the Miami Dolphins when the New York Jets let Chad Pennington drop into our lap. In addition to his passing touch, number 10 brought leadership to the young team. From the first day he walked into our uh, our program, he was a leader there. The guy came in one day, we already we knew they were going to be our leader. He's our captain now for one day. Pennington went on to earn Comeback Player of the Year honors. And by the season's final week, the Dolphins were poised to win their first AFC East title in eight years. Playing against the team that cut him just five months earlier, Pennington and the Dolphins cap their storybook season with a division title. It's one of the most glorious and um, unforeseen turnaround seasons in Dolphin history. The greatest turnaround in the history of the National Football League from one year to the other. Why not us? Poised to write a new and exciting chapter in Dolphins history are up-and-coming stars such as quarterback Chad Henney. Back control, Henney. Gets it off. Has been. Breaks the tackle at the five. Touchdown, Miami. In 2008, Stephen M. Ross became majority owner of the Dolphins. Star power soon followed as several celebrities became limited partners with the team. We were always Dolphin fans. We live here in South Florida, so we knew that we wanted to at least be a part of something great, but this was the right moment. We want to give the fans something that is not just the team, which of course is the center of everything, but you know, a reason to come out here and have a great time besides great football. In Miami, the true heroes are the Dolphins fans. Here are our Miami Dolphins! I mean, you gotta get something for the fans. I mean, especially the fans we got. This entire crowd is on its feet here at Dolphin Stadium. The fans, I mean, this is what they look forward to all week. 
We came down here and we're the only game in town, so we take great pride in, in bringing the community together to give them something to cheer for. And our accomplishments makes this uh, community very, very proud of being Dolphin fans. We would be in a tunnel waiting to be introduced and the electricity coming from the stands. I mean it. My hair on my neck would stand up because they wanted to see their Dolphins so badly that the cheering became deafening. Going to the airport and meeting us when we come back from away games, first 5,000 and 10,000 and 20,000 and 50,000 people. They had to shut down the airport, literally make it off limits for fans because it was closing down the operation in Miami International Airport because football fans were going to see their team. How many places you know like that? Everybody, Democrats, Republicans, Latins, Blacks, Anglos, they all came together because they were rooting for one thing, the Miami Dolphins. People's butts that are in those seats out there in, in the uh, Dolphin Stadium now are sons and daughters of the fans that watched us, perhaps grandsons and granddaughters. It's become a tradition. In a short time, you understand that in Chicago, you understand that in New York, where there's been 50, 70, perhaps 80 years of professional football. Hell, Miami didn't start till 66. Where'd the tradition come from? Because the fans wanted it. I enjoy the relationships that we've made over a period of time and the accomplishments uh, of the organization. It's nice to be a part of the, this Dolphin history here in South Florida. Bowl in sunny Miami, Florida comes to life as the American Football League's newest entry, the Miami Dolphins, host the Denver Broncos. The Miamians trail in the Eastern Division of the AFL, but are packed with outstanding veterans and capable rookies. Dolphin head coach George Wilson Sr. has had some expected problems with his AFL fledglings, but his son, George Wilson Jr., has been a big surprise. This 23-year-old rookie quarterback was only a second-string signal caller at Xavier, but has done well in the pros thus far. The Denver Broncos come to the land of fun and sun, trailing in the Western Division, so this game is a real challenge for the Miami Dolphins. Better than 23,000 looking on in the Orange Bowl as Gary Croner kicks it off for Denver. And waiting for it is Miami's Joe Auer, number 32, who grabs it on the 3. To the 10, the 15, up past the 20 and dumped on the 23 by Croner and Lonnie Wright. First and 10 for Miami on the 23. George Wilson, Jr. calls the numbers for the Dolphins. Takes the screen, finds a man in the middle, but throws incomplete intended for Auer, overthrown. Second and 10 from the 23. They try to blitz him, and he's going to eat that ball. He does. Thrown for a loss, but the marker is flipped here by the referee, Jack Best, and Denver is detected offsides, so it's second and five on the Miami 28. Hand off to Billy Joe. Sweeps the left side and manages to pick up a couple of yards here. Third and three on the Miami 30. 
Our and Joe in the backs. This is our straight ahead. Pitch the left side for a couple of yards, but they're forced to punt now, still deep in their own territory with fourth and one. And linebacking Wahoo McDaniel is back in long punt formation. The safety man is Goldie Sellers, number 21, second in the lead in returning these punts. At the 20, to the 30, and finally brought in by George Chesser, number 28 at the 36. Denver's ball for the first time. First and 10 on the 36. John McCormick is the quarterback, but Adner Haynes has trouble hitting the right side and has dumped for an eight-yard loss. He's blitzed by Cook. Second and 18 on the 28. Here's a screen complete to Wendell Hayes on the 33, just good for yard, and he's stopped by Jack Thornton, looking from Auburn. Third and 17 on the 29. McCormick, way back, throws the screen, but it's incomplete. Short, intended for Abner Haynes, so they're going to have to punt. And the league's leading punter, Bob Scarpedo, is back there. He's got a good average of 44.9 and has punted the ball 36 times previously. On the receiving end is our at the 26. But he's forced to backpedal. It's dumped very hard on the play by Gene Jeter. On the 20-yard line. So it's Miami's ball again. First and 10 on the 20. No score. On the run, Wilson flips. This one's complete for the veteran Dave Kosurik for 11 yards and a first down. First and 10. Miami's on the move for the first time. Billy Joe gets the call, hits the right side, but is dumped for a two-yard loss by Goose Gonsulin and Ray Jacobs. Two big men, second and 12. Straight ahead goes Hour. This time gets four yards off the right side. Same tacklers, Gonsulin and Jacobs. Oh, they're big fellas. Third and eight on the 33. Wilson back, throws a screen pass, grabs at the 27, to the 35, to the 40. That's Billy Joe, picks up a beautiful block at midfield, could go all the way, still lumbering, down close, he is in there for a touchdown. It measures 67 yards off a screen pass to the left to Billy Joe, formerly of the Buffalo Bills, and they're on the board. Mingo makes the kick good, and here's a quick shot of Billy Joe gaining the necessary oxygen along the sidelines. So Miami is on the board 7-0, and Mingo, formerly of San Diego, kicks off to Abner Haynes, the veteran number 28 from North Texas State. Oh, he's booting that ball. He might lose it, and it is grabbed off by Billy Cronin from Boston College, number 90. And it's Miami's ball on the Denver 20. Nice handoff to Billy Joe. Hits the left side for two, stopped by Bull Bramlett. Second and eight on the 18-yard line. George Wilson, Jr., the young quarterback from Xavier, whose dad runs this ball club. Throws to the end zone, knocked down and broken up beautifully that time by Johnny Griffin, intended for Dave Kosurik. So it's third and eight from the 18, and we watch in slow motion now on the key third down and long yardage play. Tries the screen. It's complete all right, but not for far. Billy Joe just gets it for no gain. Smacked down hard by Danny LaRose, formerly of Missouri. So they'll try the field goal. Wilson holding, Mingo kicking, and it's up, and it is good for 25 yards, and Miami leads Denver 10 to nothing. Denver is held shortly thereafter, unable to move that ball, and the Dolphins eventually take over with a first and 10 on their own 19-yard line in the Orange Bowl, leading 10 to nothing. Billy Joe in the backfield, bowls over the right side for four yards. That Ray Jacobs weighs about 260 pounds. He stopped him, second and six on the 24. The handoff to Auer, he alternates, he plows, fumbles, and there's a recovery by number 50 of Denver. It's Jerry Hopkins at the Miami 22. So they'll try to make it pay off now. Denver's ball trailing 10 to nothing, first and 10 on the Miami 22. The handoff goes to Hayes, hits left tackle for two. Miami loses five offsides. McDaniel had made the stop at second and five on the 17, and this time Hayes hits the left side for two, and big Tom Namina is there to bring him in, 260 pounder. Second and three on the 15-yard line. Deep pitch out. Abner Haynes tripped up from behind, gets nowhere. No gain. Westmoreland did a good job of stopping him. Third and three on the 20. In slow motion. McCormick, the quarterback of the Broncos in action. Cocks his arm and cuts loose with a bullet. Right down the middle to big number 88, Al Denson, for 15 yards and a first down and goal to goal on the Dolphins' five-yard line. Watch the call here. That's Abner Haynes. Trap right over the hole. Nobody touches him. He's in there. Touchdown, Abner Haynes at 
the end of the first quarter after the extra point is kicked by Croner. It's Miami 10, Denver 7. Well, midway through the second quarter, Miami leads Denver 10 to 7, first and 10 on the Miami 30. Wilson hands off to Billy Joe, who hits the left side to three, stopped by Bull Brandon. Second and seven on the 33. Number 30 is Sammy Price, a rookie from the University of Illinois. 5'11", 217. He stopped for yard loss here, though. Third and eight on the 32. Wilson throws the screen to Billy Joe, but this time he turns in the wrong direction. It's complete for a seven-yard loss, thanks to Billy Keating's job of stopping him here. So on fourth and one, they're forced to punt. With old pro Wahoo McDaniel back there to boot that ball. Old number 54 kicks it away to Darrell Lester, number 26, and he goes nowhere. They do give him a yard. Thornton brings him in. Denver's ball, first and 10 on the 33. Miami leading 10-7 here in the second quarter. McCormick under center, hands off to the veteran Abner Haynes. Hits the right side for three. Runs right into Al Dotson. Second and seven on the 36. John McCormick, fourth year man from the University of Massachusetts. Throws the slant into the left, incomplete, intended for Haynes, overthrown, and we're third and seven at the 36 now. With McCormick in action again. Having trouble. Does get rid of the ball. Incomplete, intended for Bob Scarpino. Broken up nicely by Jimmy Warren. Watch it, man. Watch it. Break it up. <laughs> Miami versus Denver. Miami leading 10 to 7, fourth and 7 on the 36 yard line. Scarpedo gets a bad snap from center, but he does get the ball away cleanly. And a fair catch is called by Joe Auer of the Dolphins on the 22. Dolphin ball, first and 10 on its own 22. There's a funny one. The ball is snapped to Billy Joe off the shotgun offense. He grabbed the ball in front of his quarterback, George Wilson Jr., and he gets nine yards sweeping the left side. How do you like that one? Here's the shotgun again on second and one. He throws complete to Dave Kosurik for seven yards and a first down. Beautiful play. First and ten on a 38. Back to his orthodox offense. Here is Joe along the sides. They're knocking him down like duck pins at the 30, the 20, the 15, the 10. Will he go all the way? He's in there for a touchdown. But hold the phone. Ladies and gentlemen, the marker is dropped by Jack Best, the referee. Illegal use of the hands on offense against Miami. They lose 15 on the play. First and 25 on the 23. Here's the shotgun again with Wilson back there deep. On the run. Cuts loose. The screen to Rick Casares is big pulled back for six yards. Stopped by Griffin. It's still second and 19 on the 29. In slow motion. The draw play to Casares, formerly of the Chicago Bears. But the old pro from Tampa gets only a one-yard gain. Stopped by Bramble. Third and 18 on the 30. Wilson picking out a long, long target. Tries coast to coast downfield. Roderick in the clear. Grabs it on the run, number 87, and has it. What a play. Good for 64 yards, and it's goal to go with first down. Willie Brown tackled him from behind. It's on the six-yard line. Here's Casares again. Gets three yards off the left side. Second and goal to go on the Denver three. Miami leading 10 to seven. Long count by Wilson. Howard tries to dive tackle it. Fumbles. And a recovery here by number 55, Archie Matzis of Denver, formerly of Michigan State. At the seven yard line, Denver's ball. Now the old pro, Tobin Rote, number 11, comes into the game. Tries a draw play. On his first assignment to Abner Haynes, and it's a good one. A 12-yard gain, first down. From Tobin Road to Abner Haynes, first and 10 on Denver's own 19. Tries it again. A good opening here for Wendell Hayes. Off the right side for four, stopped by Namina. Second and six on the 23. Veteran of both the AFL and the NFL, and this time the All-Pro is going to have to eat that ball. Back to pass, he loses 10 yards by Namina, and at the end of the first half, it's Miami 10, Denver 7. We start the third quarter with Miami leading 10 to 7, and Mingo kicking off for the Dolphins. This game had started in the late afternoon, and the lights are on. The Orange Bowl, Sellers on the receiving end. Coming sidewise, will he be caught? Brought down hard. He is 
by Pete Jackass, number 44. First and 10 on the 16-yard line. McCormick, the quarterback, hands off to Haynes, sweeps the left side and picks up three running right into Dick Westmoreland. Gets three yards on the play at second and seven on the 19. McCormick from Massachusetts calls those numbers for Denver. Tries a long bomb downfield and for Scarpedo. Incomplete. Appeared to be in the clear. Was broken up by Jimmy Warren, who was angry because he didn't intercept it. Should have had it, he says. So it's third and seven on the 19-yard line. Tight set in the backfield. Angles a pass, a beautiful leap by Abner Haynes for 14 yards and a first down. A beautiful leaping grab. First and 10 on the Denver 33-yard line, trailing 10 to 7, and trying to get on the boards. Here's slow motion. Sideline pattern. Complete to Scarpedo. Gets away from one man and finally falls toward the sideline stripe for a six-yard pickup. So it's second and four on the 39-yard line of Denver. Deep handoff to number 33, Wendell Hayes. Bulls forward for two, but Denver is detected. Illegal procedure here, a five-yard penalty. They lose five, second and nine on the 34 on the next play. McCormick cuts loose. Hits the sidelines intended for Denson, incomplete. Short, third and nine on the 34 now. He goes to the air lanes again. McCormick being chased. Throws off balance. Intercepted by Tommy Irvinson at the 42. And is finally brought down on the 37-yard line by Jerry Stern. Beautiful interception by Irvinson, the linebacker. Miami's ball first and 10. Hand off to Hour. Sweeps the right side. Picks up a couple and is stopped by Big Goose Gun Sulin. And it's second and eight on the 35-yard line. Wilson has gone all the way offensively. A rollout. To the weak side, running to the sideline. 5, 10, 19 yards. Beautiful game until Bramlett brings him down, but it's a first and 10 on the 16. Billy Joe gallops off the left side for three, running into Sobrani. Second and seven on a 13 yard line. Wilson calls the numbers. The call goes to Hour. He hits the right side for two. Stopped by Matzis. Big number 55, but Denver loses five offsides, and it's third and two on the Denver eight-yard line. Wilson having a field day, and a field night, you might say. He sneaks for two more. Big Ray Jacobs, close to 300 pounds, but it's a first and goal to go on the six-yard line of the Broncos. Power hits the right side. Five more yards. Gun in there to stop him. They're one yard short of the goal line. Second down. George Wilson calls the numbers. Hour in the backfield. Wilson tries a sneak, runs right into Keating. No gain. Third and goal to go on the one-yard strike. You can read his lips. Here's Hour. Hits the right side. Touchdown. Joe Hour. His third TD of the year. And the flipper flips. In Florida. Time is 419. The extra point is good by Mingo. The score is Miami 17, Denver 7. And here's Mingo again. The veteran from the coast, now with Miami, booting off. Waiting for it is Charlie Mitchell near the goal line. Up close to the 10, hit hard. He loses the ball. It's loose. And number 90 falls on it. Bill Cronin recovers. His second time in the ball game. Miami's ball again. Goal to go on the nine-yard line. George Wilson Jr. Jr. has raced into the game. Flips to the end zone. The man's in the clear, but he can't hold on. Johnny Roderick, overthrown in the clear. Remember that great catch that Roderick had made earlier? Youngster from the SMU. Second and goal to go on the nine. Wilson's going to try again. Good protection. Now he's being rushed. Now he loses the ball. Now it's gained by number 56, Bo Bramlett. Hit hard by Gene Jeter. And it's Denver ball. Just when Wilson seemed right on top of the chance for another touchdown. Denver ball, first and ten. Move it along now to the 28-yard line. Road is in there. Passes complete to Charlie Mitchell for 12 yards and a first down. Wahoo McDaniel makes the stop, first and ten, on the Denver 40. The veteran road. Deep handoff to Haynes. Cuts back over the left side for five. Second and five. Tobin Rope, the old pro, is in there, calling the numbers now. Takes a pitch out. Hands off to Wendell Hayes. Hits the left side for four. Runs right into Big Al 
Dotson having a whale of a day defensively. Third and one on the 49-yard line. Miami leads 17-7. This is Hayes again, slamming off the left side for two, but it's a first down. First and ten on the Miami 49-yard line. Roth stays in. Play pass, being rushed, smothered, loses seven yards. Dotson and Cook, two teaming. The third quarter comes to an end with Miami leading 17-7 as we switch action now to the other end of the field at second and 17 on the 44 of Denver. In slow motion, he fakes to the right. Rote being rushed again, being buried by arms, loses 11 yards, and Ed Cook, the veteran from Maryland, is the hero of the moment for Miami. Third and 28 to go, back on the Denver 33-yard line. Abner Haynes is going to give it a try, sweeping the right side and being chased hard by Al Dotson, the big defensive tackle who throws him for... A mild loss here. It's fourth and 23 on the 38. Scarpedo back. Gets the low snap from center again, but kicks cleanly away toward the end zone. And it should be a touchback, and it is. Miami leads 17-7 to over Denver. We're early in the fourth quarter. Miami leads and has that ball first and 10 on its own 20 after the touchback. George Wilson, Jr., the quarterback. The handoff to Billy Joe. And... He's thrown for a loss of five yards by Goose Gonsula. Doing quite a job. Second and 15 on the 15-yard line. Miami leading 17 to 7. The handoff to Joe Auer. Hits the right side for 5, 10, 12 yards. Gonsula and Bramlett are there to two teaming. Third and three now. On the Dolphin 27 off the shotgun offense. On the run is Wilson. Eggs to Billy Joe. Screen style, but he drops the ball. Incomplete. And now the punt is in order. Fourth and three on the 27. Wahoo McDaniel, the old pro from Oklahoma, is back there to boot the ball and not too deeply. Up to the Denver 31 yard line. So it's Denver ball, first and 10 on the 31. The Broncos take over. Let's see who does the quarterbacking here. It's Tobin Rote, the 38 year older. Short pitch to Adner Haynes. Hits the left side on the pitch out, but loses two as he's dumped by Mel Branch. Second and 12 on the 29. Miami leading 17 to 7. Midway in the fourth quarter now. Wrote back. Turns around. Still looks for that receiver. Eats the ball and is smothered. Ten yards. He's blitzed. Led by Al Dotson. Third and 22 on the 19. Here's Wrote again. Handing off to Abner Haynes. Sweeps the left side. Picks up five. But they have to punt themselves. It's fourth and 18 on Denver's own 24. Bob Scarpedo. Gets a high peg from center, but he boots it away cleanly, waiting for it. Is Joe Auer. It is over his head. He drops it, picks it up again. He's back at the 11. Still looking for running room and being surrounded and dropped, led by Jason Francie, the rookie from Santa Barbara, and Lonnie Wright. Miami ball on the 11-yard line. First and 10. Deep handoff to Joe Auer. Hits the left side for three, but a loss of three results. On the next play, Auer picks up four, and that makes it third and nine on the 12 now as we watch the shotgun in slow motion. Wilson back. Cool, calm. Fakes his way clean of two or three men, then cuts loose with a long bomb downfield intended for Johnny Roderick, the rookie from SMU, and he overthrows Roderick number 87. So on fourth and nine on Miami's own 12-yard line with the Dolphins leading 17 to seven, Wahoo McDaniel is back again in his own end zone. Booms it away. Upfield in his own territory. Bounces back toward the 39 and killed off after just a 28-yard punt. Denver ball on its own 30 on a Miami 39. McCormick in there, quarterbacking. Loops one downfield intended for Denson in the end zone. Incomplete. Broken up by Johnny McGeever. Denson did have one hand on the ball. Second and 10 on the Miami 39. Trying to hit that scoreboard. Trailing 17 to 7. Here's a pass complete to the veteran Lionel Taylor for 14 yards. West makes the stop. First down on the Miami 25. Denver going for broke. Looks for his rookie Eric Crabtree from Pittsburgh. And a beautiful grab in the corner by number 31 Crabtree for 24 yards. He fell, but Denver loses five. Illegal motion detected. By referee Vest, and it's first and 15 on the Miami 30. He angles one to the sideline. 
intended for Scarpedo, intercepted by Westmoreland at the 24. Up toward midfield. Look at that fellow Westmoreland go. He ought to be in the offense. And he's finally brought down by Charlie Mitchell on the Denver 35-yard line. Oh, what a job that Westmoreland's doing. First and 10 on the Denver 35. The Dolphins are on the march again. Deep handoff to Auer. Around the right side he goes, but he's dumped for one yard deficit by Billy Keating. Second and 11 on the Denver 36. Hour and Billy Joe in the backfield. Billy Joe gets the handle. Hits the right side, no gain. Big goose Gonsulin from Baylor is there to stop him. Number 23. Third and 11 on the 36 yard line. Here's the shotgun again in slow motion. George Wilson Jr. Being hounded by Bo Bramlett. He trips him up from behind. He falls. He loses nine. Good job by Bramlett. Fourth and 20 on the Denver 45. He's going to try a spot punt here by Wahoo McDaniel from the Denver 45. Aims toward a corner. Hopeful it'll roll dead now as he actually punted straight ahead. And it does roll dead at the Denver 14 yard line. Good enough. They still hang on to a 17 7 lead. First and 10 for Denver on its own 14. The flip by McCormick. Complete the table. Good for 5, 10, 15. Surrounded. Refuses to be brought down and eventually is by half a dozen Miamians. A 19 yard gain led by Dotson. First down on Denver's own 33. McCormick again. The base stater throws. Incomplete intercepted by Westmoreland again at the Denver 40. And down he goes on the 16 yard line, and this is a great day for Westmoreland. Formerly of the San Diego Chargers. There you see the Wilson men, senior and junior, consulting before their next possession. First and 10 on the Denver 16 yard line. It's Joe Auer heading left tackle for three, stopped by Gonsulin. Second and seven on the 12 yard line. Fakes the handoff, rolls out, throws on the run. Walker Surik, complete toward the sidelines for nine yards. First down and goal to go. The veteran Dave Kasurik on the receiving end. First and goal on the three. Here's Auer, the left side. Touchdown! Hour scores his fourth of the year and is having a banner day. The extra point is kicked by Gene Mingo. And the final score is Miami 24, Denver 7. Miami's first win of the year. Yes, the Miami Dolphins win their first game in the American Football League. And the upset loss for the Broncos moves them even further into the Western Division cellar. Co-owner Danny Thomas is passing out his favorite stogies. NFL Network presents America's Game, a countdown of the 20 greatest Super Bowl champions. And now, number one. the 1972 Miami Dolphins were perfect for an entire season. Don Shula coached the perfect team. He arrived in Miami in 1970 at the age of 40 but he'd already been a head coach in the NFL for seven years, and he'd already lost an NFL championship and Super Bowl III. The game is over. The New York Jets are the world champions. Shula knew perfection would come with a heavy price. The players he inherited in 1970 
would soon learn that lesson. Shula had a very keen sense of being in control. When you come into a situation like he came into, where he didn't draft hardly any of the people, I mean, he stepped in with a team that was there. People had been around, people that weren't too much younger than Shula. And as a result of that, he knew that he had to be the single voice. And let there be no mistake, his voice was final. Hold up, hold up, what the hell's wrong with our snap count? Back in a huddle, let's go. What he said was what he meant, and what he meant was the way it was going to be. When Coach Shula first arrived... Let's get something out of the drill. Everything we do is for a reason. We found out real quick there was going to be a change in the culture. With the 12-minute run, four-day practices, meetings until 11 o'clock at night, we were either on the field or in the meeting rooms. Seemed like 16 hours a day. Hardly had enough time to get any sleep. Shula had no mercy on us. We weren't even allowed water on the field. And they complained and, and moaned about it. And then we won our first game. And then we won our second game. Then later in the year, when the players were interviewed, they said that, you know, you know, how did this turnaround come about? And they all said invariably, you know, we worked harder than the other team. We practiced harder. We're out there later and uh, we got more accomplished. In Shula's first year in Miami, the Dolphins won 10 games, seven more than in the previous season. He had a way of getting the most out of you, and I think he did it by getting the most out of himself. We could see how hard he worked. We could see how intense he was. no secret why he was the winningest coach in football. In 1971, Shula led Miami to Super Bowl VI. It was his third title game in eight years, and this time, he planned on being rewarded for all of his hard work. You got it from Miami, you think going to win. It got to. Why? Yeah, all this way for nothing, you know. No sense in losing now. The Dolphins' two-year turnaround did an about-face against the Dallas Cowboys. To this day, it's hard for me to talk about that loss and not get emotional. I'd worked so hard to get there. It, it was just a terrible feeling, just like I'd let the whole world down. It, it, it was, without a doubt, uh, to that point, worst moment of my life. I left there, and I sat on the bumper of a car and just broke down and cried like a baby. Last time I cried was when Yeller died. Breezy dropped the ball on the snap, and it's recovered by Dallas. To cry over a poor performance is a lot of horse in my mind, but <clears throat> I wanted to get even. Dallas made us look bad that day. Dallas made us look bad because we already made ourselves look bad. And I knew that. That served as the launch pad uh, for the undefeated season. Coach Shula, I've, I've never seen him quite like he was that day. He just looked at everybody and said, this is not going to happen to us again. When we came back to Miami, they wanted to have a parade for us in downtown Miami. And I refused to have the parade. I said, I don't believe in a parade for losers. I said, hopefully, in the future, we're going to have a parade recognizing us as winners. And we'll be there for that. Yeah, for me, for me, without a doubt, the 72 season did start that evening in New Orleans. You know, when the 72 camp opened, it was a different football team. You could see it in the other players' eyes, in their motions. We all knew why we were there, and, and that was to get back to the Super Bowl and win it. I don't know how many fellows in that 72 team remember this, but at one of the very first meetings that Shula had, when we all came back together in 72, he said our objective this year is to go undefeated. Did he believe that we were going undefeated? No, I don't, I don't think he did, no. But he did say that, and, and I remember sitting in my seat thinking, oh my God, this guy is possessed, he's the devil. The devil and his dolphins should have felt right at home in the 1972 season opener. 
when Miami traveled to sweltering Kansas City for the first game ever at Arrowhead Stadium. And we go in there, and it's the hottest game that I've ever coached. I'll never forget that game because uh, I had a white shirt on with my game plan with notes that I made in ink on the game plan in my pocket. And I looked down, and the ink was running off the game plan onto my shirt. And I look across the field, and the only guy that's got a coat on was Hank Stram, and he's standing there just bearing the heat. Neither the heat nor the Chiefs could slow down the Dolphins. A great reception by Marlon Frisco. In their 20-10 win, they followed the pace set by future Hall of Famer Larry Little, number 66. Larry knew how we were affected by the heat, and he didn't want the Kansas City Chiefs to know. So when the third quarter changed and we had that time where we had to go down to the other end of the field, he led our team in a sprint down at the other end. And the Kansas City Chiefs who were thinking that we we're going to tire out in that heat looked and, and saw that happening. And I, and I think that that gave us great uh, motivation and it sort of demoralized them. Following a win over the Oilers, the physical demands of football tested fullback Larry Zonka in Minnesota. Usually, it's Zonka delivering the hit on the defensive guy. But on this particular play, Roy Winston was there. Roy Winston just about cut him in half at the kidneys. I didn't know Larry, I didn't know if he could get up off the field. You could hear the crack. I thought he'd broke his back or broke some ribs. I know this, every once in a while, when I get out of bed on cold mornings up here in Alaska, I think about Roy. And I hope somewhere out there in South Louisiana that Roy's getting up, and I hope he's thinking about me. This week three matchup would be the closest the Dolphins came to losing in 1972. Trailing 14 to six in the fourth quarter, Garrow Yepremian hit a 51 yard field goal. The kick is up, he has the distance, it is gone! With a and with less than two minutes remaining, All-Pro quarterback Bob Greasy calmly led the Dolphins towards a game-winning score. Obviously, you think it sits down there on the three-yard line. You've got the strongest, biggest uh, bull fullback in, in football. And what do you do? You fake it to him, and you go to the least likely target, Jim Mandich. 14 to 9. Greasy drops the throw. The great thing about the 72 team was that we didn't really care whose number was called. If they called me on a 119, a tight end delay, they did it because they believed the defense would suck up on it and Mandich would come open. He came wide open. That was exactly the right call. We did that game in and game out. That's what perfection's all about, is being able to control that kind of emotion that says, I want to be the guy to score. We didn't feel that way. I've never been with a group of men that were more giving in the sense that we didn't care which one of us did it. We just wanted to do it. There was a lot of intelligence and talent on our Super Bowl teams, but I know where the heart was. Number 39, Larry Zonka. Give it a Zonka. Giving the ball to Larry Zonka was a sound offensive strategy. Number 39 had a running philosophy that challenged the laws of physics. Two bodies can, can occupy the same position at the same time. As long as one's bigger and faster and going the opposite direction, they're there at the same time, but then the little one gets out of the way. He's the only running back in the history of the National Football League that's ever been called for unnecessary roughness on a tackler. Larry lowers his shoulder and his forearm and he hits the guy and he knocks him back into the middle of the field. And it, you know, cracked his jaw, drove him up, you know, folded him up. You know, he was down doing the twitch. And it was right in front of Shula, who was standing right there seeing it come to the bench. He's screaming right in my face, that's a great hit, great hit. At that time, <laughs> the flag flew in. So I think it's on the tackler. It's always on the tackler. He's marking it off against us. And I said, well, you're going the wrong way. He said, no, I'm not. Look what 39 did to that poor tackler. <laughs> and he, he looked at the flag and went, you dumb son of a... 
And not quick, he went uh, he went bonkers on me. And we got the 15 yards, but we won the game, so. Zaka and running mate Jim Kick became known as Butch and Sundance. They both arrived in Miami in 1968, and they didn't mind sharing the spotlight or the football. But in 1972, the Dolphins had a third running back who wanted to ride alongside them, Mercury Morris, number 22. When I got down to Miami in 1970, and Mercury was a guy with great ability, but he hadn't proven himself as being a dependable running back. Kick was dependable, and, and I went with Jim Kick for a long time as a starter. But then I, I started to realize the great ability of a Mercury Morris and what he added to our offense. So I started to work him in more and more to the offense. And I got to the point where I alternated, uh, depending on the situation, Jim Kick, you know, in passing situations, pass run situations, and Mercury in run pass situations. Uh, what, what yard line? I turn for Kick. And that became, I think, the beginning of situation substitution. It was also the beginning of a very crowded backfield. Now, that could have been a, a situation there where Mercury came in and it all blew up because the media really tried to blow it up. The game had to be full of mixed emotions for you. Uh, you gained over 118 yards, but your best friend, Jim Kick, almost didn't get an opportunity to play. Well, Jane, this is a touchy subject at the moment. I don't want to go into it very much. Uh, both Merck and Jim are, are fine halfbacks. Uh, no matter which one's sitting on the bench, he's not going to be happy with it. Personally, uh, you know, it's hard for me to adapt. I don't think anybody can uh, be happy uh, sitting on the bench. The same starting lineup? Yes, we're going to continue the same way. And, uh, of course, uh, the Jim Kick, Mercury Morris situation, uh, I'll just make that decision right before kickoff, depending on what series uh, we're going to open with. In 1972, Morris had 190 carries, 50 more than in his first three seasons combined. Kick had the fewest carries in his career to that point. Jim, in my opinion, was the guy that had to swallow the biggest lump uh, of pride because he cared more about being on a winning team than whether he was starting or not starting and any of that. The way Jim Kick handled Mercury Morris's situation and Mercury Morris handled the situation and Larry Zonka, the three of us were, were ground zero on that. I thought we handled it with a lot of class. You know, Jim and I were highlighted and spotlighted the year before, and Mercury sat in the wings. We got there, we almost got it done, but it didn't work, all right? We lost it all right at the end. So what can we do as a team to get better? Well, maybe putting Mercury in that mix will make the difference. And we all had that appreciation of each other because we understood how it fit together like that, not like that. Don Shula rotated his running backs, but he never had to worry about changing his quarterback until week five. Shaken up on the play is Greasy. Yeah, it looks like his, his right ankle, Rick. Uh, it may be right here. He may have to go out of the ball game. When Bob broke his leg in the San Diego game, I can remember Bill Stanfield looking at me, and it's almost like we said it at the same time, because we're in deep <laughs> With Bob Greasy injured, Shula turned to 38-year-old Earl Morrill, who had played for Shula in Baltimore. Morrill had been the losing quarterback in Super Bowl III, but Shula brought him to Miami, even though he was seven years older than the next oldest Dolphin. He was older than some of our coaches, and uh, almost as old as Shula. Danny Dodd, the equipment manager, set a rocking chair up in front of his locker. That was his welcome to the Dolphin locker room. All summer, he toiled in that heat and, and just did not look very good. I was very confident in Earl's ability to know what was going on. He's a very experienced quarterback. Whether physically he could hold up to it, what I was afraid of was when he came out was he was going to be on the next stretcher is what I was afraid of. But I didn't know how tough that old bulldog was until he got in the fight. Morrill on the snap, drops straight back to throw. He sets up, he is firing down to the corner, Warfield, touchdown! Oh. Earl drops to throw, he sets, he is firing the near side, fully open, touchdown! Oh. There's where the 
experience, the intentional fortitude come in. That's why they pay the Don Shoulders of the world the big money. That's what a coach gets paid to do. It's to get you to buy it back in again. Now, I mean, he had to sell us on Earl Morrell, and he did. Mid-season, Earl. Okay, babe. I had the confidence that Earl would do it in the pressure of a big ball game, and that's the kind of quarterback Earl was. And when I look back on my coaching career and all the quarterbacks that I've coached, I've got Hall of Famers and Johnny Unitas, Bob Greasy, and now Dan Marino. You know, Earl Morrill's in my own personal Hall of Fame. Bob Greasy would be gone for months. Earl Morrill was now the quarterback of the NFL's only undefeated team. The Dolphins at that time had the reputation of being a very methodical, business-like football team. And that was the image Coach Shula wanted us to put out front. But underlying that, we were a very rebellious team, a team full of individuals. It was a team with a very strong character, but also with an awful lot of characters. Oh my God almighty! Oh Don Shula's not-so-straight arrows made it a point to express themselves, from the afro-wearing cornerback Curtis Johnson to the bald Cypriot kicker Garo Yepremian. Won't you come home, Bill Bailey? Won't you come home? You've been away too long. Shula worked them hard. They took it upon themselves to play hard. None more so than Manny Fernandez, who got as far away from the field as possible during his free time. Hard to explain how you can fall in love with a place that really most people would never want to set foot in. But I did, I just fell in love with the Everglades. Shula gets a hold of you, he doesn't like you out here in the woods or out of the Everglades, and kind of frowns on it. No, no way would I want to go out into the Everglades. You know, there are golf courses. I want manicured things that I'm <laughs> walking out onto where I know where everything is and I got a golf club in my hand. But the Everglades, that's, that's for Manny Fernandez. Zonka is a big hunting and fishing guy. They didn't have the coordination to play golf. Let's go grab a gator then. All right. <laughs> Manny Fernandez, in my opinion, is the only defensive lineman in the history of the National Football League that can get into a nest of alligators and come out with an alligator unscathed. Where do you find people like that? Well, you are a pissed off mama, aren't you? What do you guys think of that? <laughs> <laughs> that really was when I got the idea of maybe playing a little trick on Coach Shula. So I, I open the shower door, put my foot in, and I look, and there's a live alligator looking up at me like that. And he took off, I mean, like a scalded hound. Manny says, Coach, can't you take a joke? Don has a good good sense of humor, and uh, it just never really showed. <laughs> Zonka said, Coach, you ought to be happy as opposed to being upset. I said, why should I be happy? He said, we took a vote, and you only passed by one as to whether or not we should tape up the mouth of the alligator. There were no alligators where Manny Fernandez came from. When I came out of Utah in 1968, the Dolphins were a relatively new franchise. They were just going into their third season. They hadn't attracted much of a market in Miami. There was a large Latin population, and part of the reason they brought me down there was to help sell tickets. Hey, program, here, get your line up. While I am a Spaniard, I don't speak a word of it. Fernandez couldn't speak Spanish, and he could barely see. I probably had the worst eyesight in football. I think my vision was actually 24-25 in one eye and 2400 in the other. And uh, while I couldn't see the football well in the air, I didn't really have to to be a defensive lineman. Just look for the blur, chase the blur, catch it, and that's how I played football, sort of by braille. Manny Fernandez, his college coaches at Utah would not even recommend him for the pros. He walked into the Dolphin camp as a free agent. Now he's one of the best in the game. He spins, tries to get the hand off away. Fernandez comes in and almost steals the ball. He does! Never got the recognition that he, that he really deserved. That lack of recognition made Fernandez a perfect fit with the rest of the Dolphins' defense. No-name defense. Love it, hate it, uh, little of both.
That's a name that was given to us by Tom Landry. He referred to us in an article that was stuck up on our defensive meeting room bulletin board. Uh, just a bunch of no-name guys that uh, I don't know much about, I think was his quote. Their Q rating was low. Their IQ, however, was off the charts. In one season, the entire defense made a total of nine mental errors. That says a lot about the intelligence of our team. I think that name has worked two ways for us. In, in many ways, it's hindered some fine individual performances. In other respect, uh, gave us an identity, whether we liked it or not. In 1972, Miami had the NFL's number one ranked defense. But linebacker Nick Bonaconti, number 85, is the only member of the no-names in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. When you go in the Hall of Fame, and when you look at my bust, you're not looking at the bust of Nick Bonacani. You are looking at the bust of the no-name defense. We could talk about the Purple People Leader, Steel Curtain, all the other great defenses out there, and they can call us no-names. I don't care. We were the best defense in football. That defense and three touchdowns from Mercury Morris helped the Dolphins improve to 9-0. The victory made Don Shula the youngest coach in NFL history to win 100 games. You know, the highlight of the year isn't 100 victories. That's not what I'm looking for. That's a personal thing, and personal things are really insignificant. The thing I want is a team thing, and the height of a, a team accomplishment is a Super Bowl victory. In 1972, despite the ongoing Vietnam War and the Watergate scandal, Richard Nixon won his second presidential election in a landslide. Yet amid all the turmoil, America turned its attention to the quest for the NFL's first perfect season. Shula addressed it uh, nearly every week, starting from about 8-0 and 0 on, that we uh, had to make a, an even greater effort to not get caught up in that. Uh, it's impossible not to get caught up in that. You know, we'd love to go 14-0. I'd be, uh, you know, mighty proud to be on a team that's 14-0. Don Shula's focus was on redemption, not perfection. The fact that we had a chance to do something that nobody else has ever done still wasn't as important to us as, uh, as being able to get to the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl. If we were 16-1 and one, and that loss was the Super Bowl loss, that season would have been a failure for us. First down, Dolphins at the Jets' 31-yard line. Earl Despite the talk of a perfect season, the Dolphins' actions spoke louder than their words as their 38-year-old backup quarterback continued to lead them to victories. How about that for old Bones? I got him out of the rocking chair to play. And he Which was a good thing because Don Shula did not tolerate losing. And often, he wasn't happy after a win. He strove for perfection all the time. All Don Shula's life, he treated a close victory as a loss. We sometimes would get confused. Did we win that game or lose it coming out of meetings on Tuesday? We once beat New England 52 to nothing or something. I don't know what it was. And he even had corrections in that game. I mean, you know, I. The guy was obsessed with that. The fact that we won doesn't mean that there weren't the mistakes. There were a lot of mistakes in the ballgame. His attention to detail had a psychological impact as well. It pissed you off. But don't you see that whole mechanism is a way to keep you focused? Otherwise, you just gawk in and pat each other on the back, say, good game, and you forget about it. Shula's attention to detail was never more focused than on the practice field, where he specialized in multitasking. Not many men can do this. There's a lot of women in the world can concentrate on five or six things. My mother's one of them, my aunt's a lot. There's a lot of women I meet that can concentrate on multiple things. There's only a few men that I've ever met that can concentrate on more than one or two things at a time. Don Shula's one of them. Charlie, come back toward the ball. He had the ability to stand on a practice field and look around while he's watching everything that's happening in the skeleton passing drill. Good, Paul, way to come back and get it. And managed in between corrections on the skeleton passing drill to holler down and correct something that he saw the offensive lineman do 80 yards away. I Not once did I see this. Many, many times I saw that. If you just let up a little bit in a drill uh, 100 yards away from where he was, you could hear him yelling at you. Pay attention, you know. It's like we only have two hours out here. You got to be attention. You got to be in on this thing, you know. And you wonder, how the hell did he see that? 
In 72, we were so determined to pay attention to detail, to win everything, to prove to ourselves that we could, that we did. Firing deep downfield, Warfield, and he's in for the touchdown. Following a win in New York, the 13-0 Dolphins went home for the regular season finale against the Colts. For the third straight time, Shula shut out his former team. This is a, a true effort today of 40 people uh, wanting to be the first team in history to win 14 games in a regular season. So we're very proud of this football team. I just wasn't going to dwell on that kind of uh, talk. It was didn't really matter. Going undefeated 14-0 and, and losing the first playoff game would have done us a lot of good, wouldn't it? In their first playoff game, the Dolphins did trail the Cleveland Browns late in the fourth quarter. We had gotten so used to somebody coming up with a big play when we needed it that I never really thought about losing the game. It was more a feeling of who's going to do it? Who's going to make it happen? There was always somebody coming in on that white horse. Thankfully, Butch Cassidy kick was used to riding horseback. The man who swallowed his pride most of the season wasn't about to choke now. They were undefeated and unselfish, as evidenced by the first man to greet kick on the sideline, number 22, Mercury Morris. The Dolphins were headed to the AFC Championship game. In 1972, home field advantage for the playoffs rotated by division, so the unbeaten Dolphins had to travel to Pittsburgh for the AFC Championship. But on game day, Manny Fernandez's thoughts returned to the Everglades. The headline in the paper uh, read, L-1011 crashes in the Everglades. Well, <laughs> I had gotten married just two weeks before that, and my wife was flying the L-1011. She was a flight attendant for Eastern. I thought she was on that airplane. Call the house not really expecting to get an answer. The phone rang and rang and rang and rang and rang, and I just sat there like a zombie, not knowing what else to do. Uh, and then finally it answered, and it was her. And I got all choked up, obviously. Uh, I still get choked up thinking about it. But, uh, you know, very fortunate she had swapped that flight, and the stewardess she had swapped out with survived it, which was a miracle. Very emotional morning for me. And uh, then we had to go play the Steelers in Pittsburgh. Back and looking again. One week earlier, the Steelers had beaten the Raiders on a play known as the Immaculate Reception. And there's a collision. That's, got, that's caught out of the air. Franco Harris pulled in the football. I don't even know where it came from. Harris is going for a touchdown for Pittsburgh. The AFC Championship would feature a team that seemed destined to win against a team which refused to lose. Listen, Mr. Rooney, it's luck good to see you, and uh, really am happy about everything. I want to wish you luck today, but... Well, I understand. In the early going, Pittsburgh's good luck continued. It is recovered by the Steelers, and it's a touchdown. But the Dolphins, like they had done all year, would find a way to win. The surprise hero this time was number 20, punter Larry Seipel. Fourth down, and Larry Seipel is in the punt. Larry Seipel had a green light. Anytime he felt uh, that he could pick up a first down from the punting formation. But if it doesn't work, pretty much it's your ass. You better make it. <laughs> that was my old thought, that you know, you've got the green light, Larry, as long as you make it. Seipel stand back to the Dolphins 35. Now he's going to run with the ball. 50, 45. 25 to the 20, the 15, and he's out of bounds, out of the 12-yard line. From the game films we'd seen when they, when they ran a certain return, 
everybody would hit and then they would peel to the outside and as larry stepped up he saw him starting to peel not paying any attention to him so he just followed him as they peeled to the outside i remember standing down on the sideline and hearing the steelers fans screaming turn around the defensive line was standing there looking downfield and stifle ran right by him didn't even see him coming but it was a turning point, a big turning point in that game. Seiple's play set up Miami's first touchdown. Morrow dropping back to throw. He lost one. It is struck by Drunk at the five. But the real turning point might have come at halftime. With the score tied and the Dolphins' offense struggling, Don Shula replaced Earl Morrow, who had led the team to 11 straight wins with Bob Greasy. One of the toughest decisions I ever had to make in my coaching career. I looked him in the eye and he looked right back at me. He said, Coach, he said, I don't agree with you. You know, I, you know, I want to go back in, but I respect your decision. That's the kind of guy that he was. Greasy went in and, you know, threw the pass to Warfield. It got us going and gave us that spark that we needed to win the game. Drop back to throw. He ducks up. He fires the middle. Warfield's got it. 35, 40, 45, 50. Stop at the 40. 35 to the 30. He's dragged down from behind on the Steelers' 25-yard line. For the second week in a row, Jim Kick scored the game-winning touchdown. Miami was going back to the Super Bowl. And somehow, the 16-0 Dolphins were three-point underdogs to the Washington Redskins. You know, you hate to hear teams talking about, you know, they're not showing us respect or lack of respect. But after being undefeated and still being the underdog in a, in a ball game, scratch your head and you wonder, why, you know, why us? Why no respect? You know, what, what have we done wrong? What Don Shula had done wrong was lose two of the previous four Super Bowls. And he was reminded of that often prior to Super Bowl VII. So now I'm sitting there with a reputation of a, of a coach that can win, but he can't win the big game. And you don't ever want to have that said about you if you're in a coaching profession. Shula was particularly edgy because his opponent, Redskin coach George Allen, was the master of football espionage. George Allen would resort to almost anything to find out what the other team was planning. And we were kind of enjoying the week laughing at Shula because he was really paranoid. Shula started getting upset because there were airplanes flying over our practice field. He had tarps up on the on the chain link fence. All these kids come in and try to get a football sign. Shula was checking IDs. <laughs> it's a midget coach. He's really running a movie camera over there, you know, and things. There was no way he could get to another Super Bowl and lose. Not Don Shula. If you know the man at all, you just know that couldn't happen, wouldn't happen, wasn't going to happen. End of story, and we were going to win that ball game. Let me tell you something. The only thing I miss about football is about five seconds. Five seconds in a huddle, right before you break the huddle and go up to the line of scrimmage. When you have five of the best offensive linemen that are in tune with you, Wayne Moore, Bob Kuchenberg, Jim Langer, Larry Little, and Norm Evans. And I'm looking across at them. This is the game where we're going 17-0. We're putting the final emphasis on a perfect season. Each one of them is looking at me going, run behind me. They're mouthing the words. They're not over. They can't talk in auto because greasy. They're all pointing to themselves going, anything happens, drift to me. And Bob Kuchenberg grabs me by the face mask and says, you better stick your helmet up my ass on this play because we're going in the end zone. When you have people that intent on victory, you got to just marvel. If I could go back for anything, I'd like to go back in a time machine just to, to live those five seconds and looking in the eyes of those men because that was the most confidence I've ever felt in my life about anything. Super Bowl VII, Larry Zonka ran for 112 yards as the NFL's number one ranked offense took a 14 to nothing lead. Miami then focused its number one ranked defense on NFC rushing champion Larry Brown.
people thought that we could never shut down our running attack because nobody could. But against the Redskins, Manny so dominated the line of scrimmage that Larry Brown, the great running back from the Redskins, never got to the line of scrimmage. Manny was just too quick for their center. You know, the center tried to block him one-on-one. -on -one. He would throw the center one way or the other and then be in position to make the play. And, you know, I, I had not been blocked one-on-one -on -one in really much of my whole career, so I, I thought it was like a vacation there for a while. Why did we play so well? Don't know. Maybe we were that good. For a bunch of no-names, we did OK. Manny Fernandez led the Dolphins with 17 tackles. But safety Jake Scott, who intercepted two passes, was named the game's MVP. The Dolphins had dominated Washington. Now they were dueling with destiny. If we kicked the field goal at the end of the ball game, then we win 17 to zip in our 17-0 perfect season. The field goal makes it 17-0, 17-0. Well, I don't feel we should have gone for the field goal. I think we should have tried to run it down their throat. The minute that you go after something, figuring that you're going to be 17 to nothing in a 17-0 season, that it's destiny. Destiny kicks you right square in your ass. A 42-yard attempt by your premier. Snaps it down, the kick is blocked. Rolling loose on the field. It is picked up by Garrow. He tries to throw a pass. Deflected in the air, grabbed by Bass. 40, 35, 30. He's going to score. Touchdown. By the time that comedy of errors was over, I really wanted to kill him. Not because of the kick, not because of the pass. Garrow, you probably lost his head and tried to throw a pass. But when he didn't have the guts to throw his body at Mike Bass sailing down the sidelines, that was just a total lack of character, courage. Just couldn't believe anybody could be that yellow. Uh, not even Garrow. But he, he surprised me. He was even a bigger coward than I thought he was. The perfect score was no longer a possibility. But Don Shula's perfect season was about to become a reality. 45 seconds to go. This can be the last play of the game. This is going to be it. This is it. Come on, stop him this time. The clock run out. Fourth down. Here is Kilmer. Back to throw. He is caught. And he has dropped back at the 17-yard line. That's it. It's over. There you go, Nicky. Oh, That's right, man. Don Shula, he had lost twice before in the Super Bowl, and now he watches the clock tick away as Shula has won his Super Bowl. This is my third time around, and I haven't done too well in my first two Super Bowls, as a lot of people keep reminding me. <laughs> it's been nothing but really frustration, although we've won a lot of football games, and I've been named Coach of the Year. There was always that empty feeling of not really having accomplished the ultimate. And this right here is the ultimate. We stopped them when we had to all day long, made the big turnovers, and just a, a great day for, you know, for me, for, for everybody on the team. It was just a tremendous feeling. I mean, it was, it was better than I thought it was going to be. On leaving that Coliseum that day, I think I turned around and looked at the scoreboard, and it said Dolphins World Champions. 17-0 just happened. You know, there was no script, no plans. It, it just happened, no explaining it. Whether it happens ever again or not, you know, it's just have to wait and see. They reached out and grabbed a piece of history. 35 years later, they still hold their accomplishment close to their hearts. It's the one significant thing that you can continue to guard jealously. Ladies and gentlemen, a standing ovation for the greatest football team ever football. The fact of the matter is, by going undefeated, we live on. Our ghosts crop up every year. When anyone makes it past that 5-0 and o mark, then suddenly the 72 Dolphins' ghosts start to appear. And that's a hoot. <laughs> I like being a ghost. <laughs> Don Shula and his 1972 Dolphins 
traveled a road no one else has taken. The team highlights certainly have to be 17 and 0, the only team in history, and a special bond has developed with that group of players. They wear this ring with pride. That's a pretty simple ring, but I said it's it's got something very unique on it. It's the only one that says perfect season on it. And I'll always have this ring right here to remember it by the rest of my life. The money, most of it's gone, but the ring will be here forever. One time, one place in the universe, one space was occupied by perfection, and we got to be a part of it. I'm damn glad I got to be a part of it. I'm Bob Delaney, and this is the NFL Game of the Week. Last week was playoff week. There was one game that was to stand above the rest as a memorable three and a half hours of football. The game took place in this stadium, where Kansas City and Miami would record the longest game ever played. The Chiefs and the Dolphins were to demonstrate perhaps more than ever before why the game is called football. Jan Stenerud's towering kickoffs were a weapon in themselves, preventing any return on almost every one of them. From the outset, the Dolphins would try to run on Kansas City's defense, number two in the AFC against the run. And throughout the first half, the Dolphins' tandem of Jim Kick and Larry Zonka would be unable to do so. In fact, the Chiefs dominated the first quarter both on defense and on offense. The Chiefs moved well early in the game with Dawson setbacks, number 14, Ed Podolak, and number 38, Wendell Hayes, having more success than Miami's touted duo. With Miami's defense more wary of the Chiefs' passing, their running worked well and produced an early field goal. Then on the Dolphins' second series, Greasy sprung Paul Warfield for his first catch and the Dolphins' first first down. Greasy would try to mix his targets, however, especially trying to clear his tight end over the middle. He tried this and failed, as middle linebacker Willie Lanier was in perfect zone coverage, intercepted, and caused one of the few turnovers Miami has suffered all year. An isolated view of Greasy on the last play showed that he saw his mistake immediately and came over to help on the tackle. Though he was not needed on the tackle, Greasy was playing with a sore shoulder and it was a tribute to his courage that he tried. So the Chiefs had the first takeaway of the game and Dawson took advantage. From the Dolphins 30, he moved goalward with his runners, then tried to hit Otis Taylor for the score. But the Dolphins secondary defensed Taylor well, one of the keys to the game. Taylor would make but three catches all day, and none of them game breakers. Instead, Hank Stram's strategy would be to have Dawson rely heavily on his setbacks, and in particular, Ed Podolak. And it was Podolak who scored the touchdown. Repeating the score, we can see Dawson look the defense one way and go the other, where he had Podolak and number 76 guard Mo Mormon ready to stamp out any would-be tacklers. The chief strategy of ignoring the obvious in Taylor, using him as a decoy, and instead springing the quick Podolak wide on screens and sweeps had worked well, and Kansas City led 10 to nothing.
Conversely, Miami's only offense so far had been the obvious, greasy to Warfield. Number 42 is a magician in cleats and took the Dolphins into Kansas City territory on the last play of the first quarter. The Chiefs were stifling Miami's running and Greasy really had no choice but to continue to pass. He was receiving good protection and this, plus his ability to roll out of pressure and throw accurately on the run, is one of the reasons the Dolphins got to the playoffs. His receivers are always conscious of this and work well with Greasy on a busted play, as number 80 tight end Marv Fleming did here. Three plays later, the Dolphins' Larry Zonka snuck over for Miami's first score. It was now 10-7 Chiefs. Dawson kept getting the big play from Ed Podolak, who had his greatest pro game last Saturday. The Chiefs' downfield blocking for Podolak was superb, and Podolak again sparked the Chiefs into Dolphin territory. Dawson's faking was superb, too. On the next play, he fooled almost everyone with three backfield fakes. However, he failed to fool Curtis Johnson, number 45, who stayed right with Otis Taylor and halted the drive with an interception. But the Dolphins failed to move with the interception, and the Chiefs got the ball back on a punt. It was Podolak again, using his deceptive speed to outrun the Dolphins' line and linebackers. 32 yards to the Dolphin, 29. This was to be one of the key series in the game, for although Podolak had taken them deep, the Chiefs came up empty. The Dolphins stopped them on three downs, and Jan Stenerud missed a 30-yard field goal. Stenerud had just been selected to the Pro Bowl over the Dolphins' Garo Yepremian, but the Norwegian ex-ski jumper had not had a particularly good year and had missed many medium-range attempts this year that were sure things for him in the past. None was more important than the one he missed here. So the Dolphins took over with under four minutes left in the half, and although Greasy had some success with short flips to his setbacks, the Dolphins could not reach midfield. Aside from the one touchdown drive, Miami could not figure out the Chiefs' defense, which was keying on Miami's runners, and for the most part, pressuring and containing Greasy. The Chiefs took over with a minute and a half left in the half. It was here that Ed Podolak, who had played so well throughout the game, made his only mistake. Trying merely to run out the halftime clock, Podolak lost the ball, Dick Anderson recovered, and the Dolphins would have the last shot before the half. Miami's defense is sometimes overlooked, they had produced two takeaways in the half. Greasy failed to capitalize on Johnson's earlier interception, and now he failed to score on Anderson's recovery. But Yepremian did kick a field goal here to salvage three, and the teams went into the locker room tied 10-10 at the half. In the third quarter, the Chiefs galloped downfield again on a long, time-consuming drive of the type Dawson used to beat Oakland to gain the playoffs. Stram decided to let Dawson use his wide receivers more in the second half on medium-range passes in front of Miami's zone. And two of the key plays in the drive were passes to number 17, Elmo Wright, and to Otis Taylor, who lateral to Podolak. penalty on this play reduced the gain, but on the next play, Podolak ripped through a gaping hole up the middle. Stram had inserted the third in his big back arsenal, Jim Otis, and number 35 made a key first down on third and two from the Dolphin 13, bouncing off his own blocker and moving to the one. Two plays later, Otis went up and over, 
and the 16-play, 10-minute drive had put the Chiefs ahead 17 to 10. But the next four minutes saw the Dolphins do quickly what the Chiefs had taken almost a whole quarter to do. Thus began one of the great ironies of the game, the ability of Greasy and Miami to strike back swiftly. First, Greasy hit number 81, Howard Twilley. Then it was Warfield in the quick post between Jim Kearney and Emmett Thomas to the Chiefs' seventh. Two plays later, on third and goal from the one, Jim Kick went over, and Upremian's extra point tied the score at 17 at the end of the third quarter. The game was dead even, both on the board and on the field. It would remain so for a long time to come. On the first play of the fourth quarter, Nick Bonacani recovered a fumble in chief territory, and the Dolphins picked up where they left off in the third period by moving the football. The big play was made by Bob Greasy with third and eight on his opponent's 29. The cool-headed quarterback with the aching left shoulder was brought down hard on his opponent's 17. Greasy was playing on courage, for few people know how much his shoulder injury has bothered him. Notice how limp his left arm appears. It's almost completely immobile. And though it's not his passing arm, the disability definitely hampered him in the last three games of the season, two of which Miami lost. One play after his run, Greasy passed right into the arms of linebacker Jim Lynch. Miami's first series of the new quarter, like Kansas City's, had ended in a turnover. The Chiefs had a break, the ball on their own nine, and quickly moved out on two short runs, and Dawson's pass to tight end Willie Frazier, playing in place of Morris Stroud. The Chiefs' short game had drawn the Miami defense in tight. So here, from his own 34, Len Dawson threw the long ball. It's doubtful that Elmo Wright really thought he'd scored. More likely, the rookie wanted a chance to show off his victory dance to a national television audience. Another look at this big 63-yard play in super slow motion should dispel the notion once and for all that Len Dawson's 36-year-old arm isn't strong enough to throw the bomb. On the next play, behind beautiful blocking, Ed Podolak powered past safety Dick Anderson into the end zone for the touchdown that put his team in front, 24-17. There was just seven minutes left in the game now, but it was enough time for Bob Greasy to put on a furious display of pinpoint passing that brought Miami right back in the game. First after rolling right, Greasy turned and threw across the field for his tight end, Marv Fleming, on a play that produced 13 yards and a first down on the Miami 42. Here, Greasy sprung the reverse to Warfield, but the flanker fumbled. Luckily, Bob DeMarco recovered and Miami retained possession. Third and 13, and Greasy went to his ace, Warfield, who had beaten Emmett Thomas over the middle. The Dolphins had the first down they so desperately needed. From here, Greasy simply peppered the Kansas City secondary with a succession of short, accurate passes. First to Jim Mandich at the right sideline, then a perfectly lofted pass to Warfield, who took it all the way to the Chief 12. On this key pass, Warfield was operating on the short side of the field with little room to maneuver, yet his moves completely fooled Emma Thomas, number 18, who could only leap in a futile gesture at the pass over his head. Now 
Now from the 12, Greasy continued his aerial onslaught with a rollout bullet to Howard Twilley at the five-yard line. Miami called timeout. There was now only a minute and a half remaining in the game. Here on his opponent's five, with no time left for mistakes, Bob Greasy vividly demonstrated why in this, his fifth NFL season, he has become the complete pro quarterback. Greasy's primary receiver was blanketed in the end zone, so he improvised. Rolling to his right, he spotted a secondary outlet in Marv Fleming and hit him for the touchdown. The Dolphins had again spotted the Chiefs a touchdown, then marched the length of the field to tie them. But unbelievably, even with a little over a minute left, this game was far from over. The reason again was Ed Podolak, the third year back from Iowa, took the kickoff and burned 78 yards through the Dolphins before being pushed out of bounds by Curtis Johnson. It was fitting that the all-purpose Podolak made the big play for his consistency and variety of talents are a major reason why the Chiefs won the Western Division for the first time since 1966. Now Kansas City had the ball on the Miami 22 and elected to lifelessly run three consecutive times. It ensured keeping the ball for the almost certain field goal that would win the game. The strategy also served to run the clock down, despite the fact that Miami called time immediately after each play. So the stage was set for Jan Stenerud, possibly the premier kicker in the game, to kick the winning field goal from the 32-yard line, with only 35 seconds left. It seemed like a sure thing, but it wasn't. Incredibly, Stenerud had missed the chip shot, and Miami took over with the game still deadlocked at 24 points. Surprisingly, the Dolphins failed to even run out the remaining 35 seconds and were forced to punt with seven seconds left. Time expired by the time Dennis Holman made a fair catch. But here, Hank Stram decided to forego the attempt of a free kick, which would have had to travel 70 yards and could have been returned by Miami. The game now went into overtime. The crucial coin toss was won by Kansas City. Remember, in sudden death overtime, the first team to score in any way wins, so the Chiefs had a decided advantage already. Garo Yepremian kicked off, purposely keeping the ball low and away from Ed Podolak, but he ended up with it anyway, and again made a fine return, giving his team excellent field position on their own 46. Already, the Chiefs were close to Stenerud's field goal range, and they quickly improved their position on the first play when workhorse Podolak took a screen into Miami territory. Len Dawson, who had called a fine game today, stayed with Podolak and was rewarded with even better field position. But Dawson may have gone to the well once too often, for on the next play, Podolak fumbled. And though Miami gestured madly, Kansas City recovered the ball on the Dolphin 35. Stenerud came in to kick. The game appeared lost for Miami. But Nick Bonaconti blocked the kick, and the Dolphins again had a new life after teetering on the brink of defeat. On this series, Miami's first in overtime, the chief defense seemed to vent their frustration on the Dolphins. Aaron Brown crashed into Greasy's sore shoulder, and the young quarterback obviously felt the pain. This was a great day for the AFC's number one and number two passers, both former Purdue quarterbacks, although a decade apart. Today, both were magnificent. Again, the Chiefs smelled out the flanker reverse, Marvin Upshaw tripping up Warfield for a loss that ended Miami's first overtime series. 
But their defense held the Chiefs and forced a punt to Jake Scott, the second leading returner in the AFC. And Scott's 18-yard dash gave Miami decent field position, which is so important in sudden death. Miami picked up additional yardage and a first down when Greasy fired to Twilly at the right sideline. But their next two plays got nowhere against the Chiefs defense. Watch Marvin Upshaw, number 81, shrug off a block by Larry Little. Larry Zonka was the victim. The huge fullback had been held in check so far today. Now faced with third and nine, Greasy went for Warfield, who this time was well covered by Emmett Thomas. Warfield caught seven passes today, most of them on Thomas. But here, with Miami driving, the cornerback came up with a vital save. A repeat in slow motion shows how he did it. Thomas's heroics made it fourth down and forced Miami to try a field goal from the 52. Yepremian's attempt was short, and Kansas City had the ball again. From his own 20, cool Lenny Dawson faked to Podolak and pitched to Elmo Wright, who made his second big catch of the day. Miami was giving special coverage to Otis Taylor, and though he would catch three passes today, his total yardage was merely 12. Here, faced with extinction again, the Miami defense got tough. Ed Podolak was brought down for a loss by Nick Bonacanti, one of 20 tackles or assists made today by the Dolphin captain. Now faced with third and five at midfield, Dawson tried for better position for his kicker and lost. Jake Scott fielded the ball and returned 13 yards to the Miami 46 to end one threat and set up a new one for his own team as the game went into the second period of overtime. But even this break didn't help Miami, as on third down, Greasy scrambled away from intense pressure, ran right up to the scrimmage line, and let fly with everything he had. Jim Mandich had safety Jim Kearney beaten, but the pass was on the wrong side and fell incomplete. Another opportunity had been missed by Miami, but their defense again stopped the Chiefs and Greasy had the ball on his own 35. He called for Zonka on a counter against the flow and the big back finally broke loose. This play, one of the biggest of many in this thriller, finally brought Miami into good field position, and Garo Yepremian came in to make the most important kick of the 1971 NFL season. It was good. Another look shows Yepremian knew it was good as soon as he kicked it. His holder, Carl Noonan, waited for the signal before celebrating one of the most exciting victories a team has ever won. In the longest professional football game ever played, a field goal had propelled the Miami Dolphins into the championship game. In only the fourth sudden death overtime in the league's history, the Kansas City Chiefs' dream of a third Super Bowl was ended. While Don Shula's young team had kicked and scratched and came from behind to prove that they're a team that has arrived. The NFL's day of days turned out gray and humid in Houston, Texas, but all the glitter of Super Sunday, January 13, 1974, still rang true in Rice Stadium as triumphant brass bands heralded the meeting of football's two finest teams. From the National Football Conference, led by head coach Bud Grant, the Minnesota Vikings had come to challenge the defending world champion Miami Dolphins of the American Football Conference in Super Bowl VIII. The Vikings traditionally have lived on the swarming defensive tactics, but this year, guided by the veteran quarterback Fran Tarkenton, 
the mighty purple people achieve the overall consistency and balance necessary to catapult them to super status. And ironically, if there was a weakness on the Minnesota team, according to pregame analysis, it was on defense, where the once indomitable Purple Gang had proven to be vulnerable to a straight-ahead running attack during the 1973 NFL campaign. And though the Vikings' front four Norsemen, as they were called, was a star-studded unit, it was across this line, in the battle with Miami's magnificent outcasts, that most experts believe this game would be won or lost. Magnificent outcasts like six foot six inch left tackle Wayne Moore, once cut by the San Francisco 49ers. And right guard Bob Kuchenberg, who would play this game with a broken arm, had been axed by Philadelphia and Atlanta before catching on with a minor league team of the Chicago Bears. The all pro center Jim Langer had been signed as a free agent and put on waivers by Cleveland. And pro football's premier pulling guard Larry Little was also a free agent who was dismissed by the San Diego Chargers. Tackle Norm Evans, the only remaining original Dolphin, was acquired in the AFL expansion draft from Houston in 1966. And the character of these magnificent outcasts was clearly the character of the Dolphins' full 40-man roster. Or even as they approached the doorstep of a professional football dynasty, exceeding even the glory years of the pack, people doubted the credibility of these champions who wore the colors of Howard Johnson's. Still, in honor of their unprecedented third consecutive Super Bowl appearance, the Miami Dolphins were rated slim favorites to retain their title on this afternoon of champions. But all the experts agreed that the story of this game would be told in the trenches, where Minnesota's defensive front four Norsemen would battle Miami's magnificent outcasts. In this, the NFL Game of the Week, Super Bowl VIII. I'm Al Meltzer. Miami began play as everyone expected they would, sending their great stud horse Larry Zonka charging straight ahead. A repeat of the play shows that an overpowering block by number 79 Wayne Moore cleared the way for Zonka's 16-yard bolt. Then, to keep the linebackers honest, Bob Greasy turned to Marlon Briscoe on this quick out. Good for six more yards. Then, as he would all afternoon, Greasy capitalized on Minnesota's overreaching pursuit, giving to Zonka on a counter play which brought the ball to rest on the Vikings' eight-yard line. Two plays later, the Vikings were again finessed by misdirection, and Zonka rammed home on a quick hitter, giving Miami a 7-0 advantage after their first offensive series. The 10-play, 62-yard drive was a stunning display of offensive mastery spearheaded by Larry Zonka. And just as they had begun the season with such a drive against the college All-Stars nearly six months ago, they had begun against the Minnesota Vikings in Super Bowl VIII. Then it was Fran Tarkenton's turn to answer the Dolphins. But Miami's defense was no less masterful than the offense, and Minnesota was forced to give up the ball without a first down. Still, Mike Oshide's punt almost netted Minnesota a needed break when Ron Porter separated Jake Scott from the football. But Scott in the way the champions will, recovered from his mistake when it appeared that he was out of the play and the Miami attack was back in business. And once again, Bob Greasy sent Larry Zonka tearing relentlessly into the belly of the Viking defense. But then an enraged Allen Page hit the right gap at the right time and stopped the Dolphins' gym kick with a three-yard loss. But coolly confident of his running game, Greasy backpedaled, showing pass, and handed to Zaka, who rammed ahead for 12 yards on the second and 13 situation. On third and one, great blocks by center Jim Langer and right guard Larry Little freed Zonka on another jarring run, and Miami had a first down at the Minnesota 14-yard line. Mixing his plays perfectly and taking advantage of a Viking blitz, 
Greasy then found Marlon Briscoe under the Minnesota zone, and Miami had a tough 13-yard gain the easy way. Two plays later, Jim Kick squirmed into the end zone, and the Dolphins had a 14-0 lead without allowing the Minnesota Vikings a first down thus far in the first quarter. On the last play of the first period, Fran Tarkenton earned Minnesota's first first down with this nine-yard pass to Doug Kingsrider. But on third and one at the top of the second quarter, a submarining Manny Fernandez drove Viking guard Frank Gallagher into the Minnesota backfield, and the Vikings once again were forced to relinquish the football. But with second and eight at the Dolphins' 45, the Viking defense turned mean and Bob Greasy was sacked for a 10-yard loss by Alan Page. Facing third and 18 and leading 14 to nothing, Greasy surprisingly elected to put the ball up again. And only a fine save by the Viking free safety number 22, Paul Krause, prevented a spectacular and perhaps a game-breaking reception by Marlon Briscoe. A second look at the play shows that Greasy's accurate throw was even more remarkable. Whereupon releasing the football, he was powdered by a hard-charging Carl Eller. The incompletion, Greasy's first of the half, forced Miami to punt the ball away. But the Miami defense proved equally difficult for Fran Tarkenton, and very shortly, Miami's magnificent outcasts were once again opening breakaway holes for Dolphin runners. The bruising Larry Zonka again cracked deep into Viking territory, and the Dolphins appeared on the threshold of completely dominating the Purple game. But needing only one yard for a first down, Young middle linebacker Jeff Seaman met Zonka head-on, and Miami was forced to try a 28-yard field goal by the little Cypriot sidewinder, Garrel Upremian. Upremian's boot was true, and with less than six minutes remaining in the half, Miami's lead was 17 to nothing. Then Fran Tarkenton urged the sleeping Vikings offense to life. First hitting tight end Stu Voigt for a 17-yard gain, and then connecting with Voigt again for a 14-yard gain that almost resulted in a fumble, but the ball was ruled dead at the Miami 46. Then on third down, needing nine yards, Tarkenton hit John Gilliam underneath the Miami zone for a 30-yard gain to the 15. But there, the drive ground down to a fourth down and short at the Dolphins' six-yard line. And then, as he had done in every critical short yardage situation in the half, Tarkenton called on his all-pro right tackle Ron Yeri to clear the way. And in this situation, as in each of the others, the Dolphin defense denied the necessary yardage as Miami's middle linebacker Nick Bonacotti closed the hole and the Dolphins took over to end the half with a dominant 17 to nothing advantage. The Dolphins emerged from their dressing room for the second half, fully confident of their ability to keep control of the game. Miami is the most difficult team in the league to come back against. Given any kind of lead, and with a 17-point bulge that they had fashioned, they were almost out of sight. With the stingy Dolphins defense and the runs of Larry Zonka to control the ball for long stretches on offense, 
Don Shula knew that the only way his Dolphins could be caught was by some long ball magic. And on the second half kickoff, that magic very nearly caught up with him when John Gilliam carried the ball back 65 yards. But on the play occurred the first of three excruciatingly damaging penalties for Minnesota as a clip nullified the return, bringing the Vikings a first down on their own 11 instead of the Dolphins 34. Trailing by 17, the Vikings figured to pass often in the second half, and so the Dolphins went to their 53 defense, named for linebacker Bob Matheson, number 53, which they use when the opposition is in a passing situation, and it very nearly led to a game-breaking turnover when Tarkenton went to the air. Repeating the play reveals the reason for number 57, Mike Colin's disappointment. Or when forced to dump off a short one, Tarkenton very nearly threw a touchdown pass to him. In the 53 defense, Matheson replaces alignment, and so a lot of pressure is put on the three who remain. Matheson either takes part in the pass coverage or acts as a lineman. If Matheson anticipates a pass and drops off, the other lineman must be mobile enough to stop the run, and indeed the Dolphins are. but they must also be quick enough to mount a pass rush. For if given enough time, no coverage will hold up long enough to contain a quarterback of Tarkenton's caliber. Here again, the Dolphins have what it takes. The Vikings went nowhere on their first possession of the second half, and a repeat of this third down sack shows the reason the Dolphins so successfully used their 53 defense. Watch number 75, Manny Fernandez as he first shocked center Mick Tinglehoff, number 53, and then is by guard Ed White, number 62, before he can intercept Fernandez's rendezvous with Tarkenton. The Dolphin defense forced a Viking punt from their own end zone. And with the resulting good field position, Greasy went for it all, laying the ball out perfectly for Warfield, who made a super stab. Warfield, injured earlier in the week and a questionable starter at game time, had reported to Greasy early in the game that he could go full strength. Greasy had waited for the right time, and Warfield had graphically proved his readiness and his greatness. But with a critical third down, the Vikings defense finally swamped the Dolphin offense with an eight yard loss. The play should have forced a field goal, but again, the Vikings committed a grievous penalty, a holding penalty giving Miami a first down on the six. Two plays later, Zonka barged in for his second touchdown of the game. Greasy revealed after the game that he had forgotten the snap count. And when he turned to ask Zonka the count, he too had blanked. The usually conservative Greasy decided to go ahead with the play anyway. And indicative of the great team that the Dolphins are, they made the play work for a touchdown despite the confusion. Zonka, who required stitches near his off-broken nose in the first half in order to continue the game, was momentarily stunned 
but he rushed it in the end zone with his second score of the day. And typically, the first man to congratulate him was a lineman, guard Bob Kuchenberg. After the game, Kuchenberg said, if I have an idol on this team, it's Larry Zonka. He's just a blood and guts player. To me, he's the ultimate football player. Zonka's touchdown and Yepremian's extra point made the score Vikings 0, Dolphins 24. In the fourth quarter, Tarkenton finally began to solve the Dolphins' puzzling zone. Mixing short, over-the-middle passes to tight end Stu Voigt and short outs to his wide receivers, Tarkenton led the Vikings deep into Dolphin world. Finally, with 12 minutes left in the game, Tarkenton kept the ball himself and crossed the Dolphin goal line. Because they were using short passes exclusively, Minnesota had gone to a double tight end offense. And on a repeat of the touchdown, we can see that it paid off as number 89 tight end Doug Kingsrider cleared Tim Foley out of Tarkenton's path. Trailing now 24-7, Minnesota's only hope was an onside kick, and Fred Cox hit it perfectly. Terry Brown, number 24, recovered the kick, and the Vikings had possession on the Dolphin 49. But once again, a big, big Viking play was nullified by a penalty, as they had been offsides, and their last chance appeared doomed. But for the first time in the game, the Vikings' defense held the Dolphins to three downs and lost only two minutes of the clock. But more importantly, what the Vikings had lost was field position. And as a crowning touch to a total team, Dolphin punter Larry Seipel dealt the death blow with a perfect kick. Still, Tarkenton and the Vikings refused to submit, and working to Ed Marinero, Frantic Fran went back to his short pass attack. Marinero is the Vikings' best pass receiver coming out of the backfield, and he was in the game for that reason. But on the second catch of the drive, he proved he could run, too. This pass to Marinero was Tarkenton's 18th completion in the game. It set a new Super Bowl record, but one he would gladly have traded for a win. A win that was locked up by the Dolphins when Curtis Johnson intercepted what was to be the Vikings' last offensive play of the game. The Dolphin defense had done their part, and with six and a half minutes left, they gave the ball over to the offense to accomplish their mission. In a fitting close to their performance, the Dolphin offensive line was able to create the cracks that enabled Miami to keep the ball for the remainder of the game. Time after time, Greasy called Zonka's number, and though they knew he was coming, the Vikings could not stop pro football's premier power runner. On the sidelines, the Dolphin defense celebrated and then watched the action, grateful that it wasn't they who had to try and stop Larry Zunka and his inexorable advance into Super Bowl history.
Finally, with less than a minute to go, Zonka left the game to a standing ovation for Super Bowl VIII's outstanding player. 33 carries for 145 yards, both Super Bowl records. Trailing Zonka came the members of the Dolphin offensive line, who had made Miami's domination of the NFL championship game possible. Each got his reward in a grateful handshake from head coach Don Shula. With their 24-7 conquest of the Vikings, Shula's Dolphins had matched the feet of Vince Lombardi's Green Bay Packers, back-to-back -back Super Bowl championships. They have now matched or eclipsed all of the great Lombardi records. A comparison is inevitable, for if Lombardi's great Packer teams were the team of the 60s, Shula's Dolphins are certainly the team of the 70s. And with just one challenge left to conquer, three straight Super Bowls, they may be the greatest team of all time. It's hot out there, but let's blow them off the line of scrimmage. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. The Buffalo Bills have the not so dubious distinction of entering the Orange Bowl having not won there since 1966. 16 games have been played in this South Florida playground since Lyndon Johnson was president, and the Bills have managed only a tie against the Miami Dolphins, that in 1968. But we are now in 1983, and the Dolphins have been lying down on the job a bit too much to suit coach Don Shula's taste. To awaken a slumbering offense, the Dolphins have handed the ball over to rookie quarterback Dan Marino, their number one draft choice from Pittsburgh. Marino's inexperience could give an edge to the Bills, who boast 11-year veteran Joe Ferguson at the helm. Ferguson has looked good in 1983 in implementing the offense designed by first-year head coach Kay Stevenson, a former Bills assistant. After an opening game shutout at the hands of these Dolphins, Buffalo's offense has been sharp, as Ferguson has enjoyed one of his best starts ever. Stevenson is hoping that his Bills can make Dan Marino's first NFL start a losing one, and in the process, change the course of Dolphins-Bills history. This AFC East rivalry has been lopsided in favor of Miami. From the Orange Bowl, it's the Buffalo Bills and the Miami Dolphins in the NFL Game of the Week. The game's start was marred by turnovers. On the opening kickoff, Buffalo's Rob Riddick, number 40, took the ball five yards deep in his own end zone and sprinted to the 13-yard line before fumbling. The Dolphins recovered, giving Dan Marino excellent field position at the Bills' 17-yard line. But Marino's first pass was tipped at the line of scrimmage and picked off by Steve Freeman, number 22. Freeman's interception was an early indication that Buffalo's defense was going to be a tough nut to crack for Marino in his first NFL start. Entering this week six contest, the Bills ranked fourth in the league in defending the pass, and they made it rather uncomfortable for the rookie quarterback from Pittsburgh. A strong pass rush led to a sack by Ben Williams, number 77. But the biggest problem Marino had was reading Buffalo's complex pass coverages. He was saved from a second interception when cornerback Chris Williams, number 27, couldn't hold on to a ball that appeared to be thrown right to it. While Marino was somewhat confused in the pocket, 
11-year veteran Joe Ferguson was poised and confident as he coolly picked out open receivers. First number 82, Frank Lewis over the middle. Then a couple of short quick strikes to running back Joe Cribbs, number 20. Second completion to Cribs brought the ball inside the Dolphins' 20-yard line. From there, Ferguson continued to attack the NFL's number one pass defense through the air. On third and five from the 10-yard line, he found Byron Franklin, number 85, on the left side of the end zone for the touchdown. With 16 seconds remaining in the first quarter, the Bills had jumped out to a 7-0 lead. Buffalo victories in the Orange Bowl have been excruciatingly difficult to come by, and no one knows that better than Joe Ferguson. Ferguson has had his shares of ups and downs as Buffalo's quarterback for the last decade. Most agree that when he's on, he's as potent as any passer in the league. Against the Dolphins, it was evident that Ferguson was on. A bullet over the middle to Lewis helped set up Ferguson's second touchdown pass in five minutes. A beautifully thrown ball to Franklin, number 85. The second hookup between Ferguson and Franklin increased Buffalo's lead to 14 to nothing and showed most convincingly that the Bills intended to break the Orange Bowl jinx by being aggressive, not by sitting back and waiting for something to happen. Marino was now in a tough spot. His confidence could not have been very high at this point in the game, five minutes into the second quarter. But he kept throwing, and again the Bills showed him that it's not easy to be a rookie quarterback starting in the NFL. Number 52, Chris Keating's interception pointed out a major difference between college and the NFL. Keating, a linebacker, dropped back to play the pass, and Marino, not expecting a linebacker to cover so quickly, fired the ball without knowing or seeing the defender. The result was an interception, Marino's second of the half. Don Shula had little to be happy about with his team trailing 14 to nothing in the Bills at the Miami 25-yard line. The Buffalo did not score, and Shula decided it was time for the Dolphins to go to the ground game. Woody Bennett, number 34, was the main man as the Dolphins mounted their first serious scoring opportunity of the half. Bennett carried four times for 37 yards. The last yard producing Miami's first touchdown of the game. The Dolphins went 86 yards in 12 plays, running the ball on eight of them to cut Buffalo's lead to 14 to seven. But with less than five minutes left in the first half, Bills coach Kay Stevenson was not about to turn conservative. He wanted more points and so it was time for Ferguson to go back to the air. A diving catch by Jerry Butler, number 80, was followed by a more routine Ferguson to Butler connection and the Bills were quickly in field goal range. But Joe Danello's last minute field goal attempt was no good and Buffalo settled for a 14 to seven halftime advantage. 
The Bills had played a strong first half, but their failure to capitalize on two excellent scoring opportunities haunted them as they made their way to the locker room. The second half began with Buffalo's defense again putting pressure on Marino, as Ben Williams, number 77, registered his second sack of the day. But Marino had remained rather calm in the face of the Bills' clawing defense, and he began to pick out his receivers as the third quarter unfolded. A short completion to Mark Duper, number 85, obviously helped Marino's confidence. For on the next series, he again threw to Duper, only this time it was good for 63 yards and the tying touchdown. Marino had survived a shaky first half, and his long pass to Duper showed his teammates that he could bring them back. Dolphin fans of all ages rejoice. Be proud to wear your Dolphins cap. Unfortunately for Miami, the 14-14 tie did not last very long. A wild third quarter continued when Ferguson tossed his third touchdown pass of the game. This one to number 34, Booker Moore. The Bills bounce back in a hurry on a play that seems so easy to execute. Another look shows that Ferguson's fake to Joe Cribbs, number 20, sent everybody to the right leaving Moore all alone for the 11-yard score. Buffalo refused to fold when the Dolphins came back. Instead, the Bills showed that their previous performances in the Orange Bowl may be nothing more than a bit of ancient history. Maybe it was time for Buffalo to write a little of its own history. To Don Shula's way of thinking, matters had now progressed entirely too far for this game to be without one of his world-famous gadget plays. And late in the third quarter, the Dolphins finally came up with one, much to the delight of the Orange Bowl faithful. Rookie wide receiver Mark Clayton found fellow pass catcher Mark Duper for his second long scoring reception of the period. Miami's double reverse buffaloed the Bills completely as the Dolphins tied up the ball game again. Duper's two dazzlers had been a somewhat unexpected bonus so far, but there was one Miami constant that had not been quite as prominent. Even with their league-leading ranking as the number one defensive unit, the Killer Bees were not being quite as ornery as they had shown in the past. Now that the Miami offense had shown some spark, perhaps the B-Boys would get down to stopping a will-o'-the-wisp of a different stripe, Buffalo runner Joe Cribbs. But that wasn't going to be easy. On the Bills' very next drive, Cribs was the featured performer, and the Dolphin defense was unable to stop him. Cribs accounted for most of the Bills' yardage in this early fourth quarter march thus entitling him to scoring honors when the drive's grand finale was in sight. It was one of nine receptions Cribs would make on the day, a performance that had to convince anyone watching this game that although Cribs may not be playing for Buffalo next year due to contract obligations elsewhere, Lame duck status is a condition he simply will not tolerate. Thanks to Cribs and the increasingly incendiary passing of Joe Ferguson, the Bills had taken the lead for the third time. But this game would see no one go up by more than a touchdown the rest of the way as the seesaw affair continued.
Young Dan Marino continued to match the veteran Ferguson pass for pass and yard for yard. Mark Clayton hauled in this Marino bomb, and then the Dolphin infantry began to pound away at Buffalo's defense with slashing and profitable little runs. Tony Nathan got the team close, then Marino wrapped up the drive with a scoring toss to old reliable wide receiver Nat Moore, number 89. Nat's catch enabled the Dolphins to tie for the third time, and a big ingredient to the play's success was a well-timed block from Miami fullback Andra Franklin, number 37. When Marino rolled out, Franklin protected the passer with his blocking, thus giving the rookie quarterback time to make the completion. Little more than seven minutes remained in the game, and the outcome was still far from decided. The Bills, who had the better of things for most of the afternoon, still found themselves tied at 28 and had to wonder if the Orange Bowl jinx was that powerful. Could Buffalo overcome the mental stigma of their dreary history of Orange Bowl defeats and still win the game? The answer would not come until they had ridden out an emotional roller coaster that would carry both teams to a stunning and surprising conclusion. It seemed as if each Bill, in his own way, was trying to get himself mentally prepared for the crunch time of this game. But no amount of sideline psyching could prepare them for what proved to be Joe Ferguson's only real mistake of the ball game. And from Buffalo's point of view, it could not have come at a more inopportune moment. Ferguson simply overthrew his receiver and number 41 Fulton Walker easily intercepted. This was the break Miami had been waiting for and it didn't take long to capitalize on it. The rookie combination of Marino and Clayton clicked again and suddenly the Dolphins were in the driver's seat. Marino's first pro start had been very impressive with three touchdown passes within a 20 minute span. For the first time in the game, the Dolphins had the lead. And with three minutes to play, it looked like Miami's mastery over the Bills was going to carry over for at least one more year. That is, if the Killer Bees could shut down the Bills for good. By all appearances, this looked like Buffalo's last chance, so the Dolphins needed to make a big play early to stunt the drive. They got it when Mike Kozlowski, number 40, ran a safety blitz which put Ferguson and the Bills in a dangerous third and long situation. The Dolphins were just about ready to celebrate, but that would have been a mistake. For Joe Ferguson was having his day of days as a professional quarterback. He set new team highs for attempts, completions, and yardage. On this drive alone, he completed nine passes. Ferguson would finish the game with 38 completions for 419 yards, shattering team marks that had stood for nearly 20 years. And right now, he was shattering the veneer of Dolphin defensive invincibility as he marched his team toward the game-tying touchdown.
Miami stopped Jerry Butler just short of the end zone, bringing on a nail-biting fourth and one situation. Only 28 seconds remained in the game. Ferguson came through with his fifth touchdown pass of the day. And following a Joe Danello extra point, the game was tied once again at 35-35. Don Shula himself was fit to be tied as he had seen his lead slip away. But more Dolphin frustration was to follow as the game moved into overtime. Miami won the toss and appeared as if they were going to settle matters quickly. At least it seemed that way for a while. But Buffalo's stiffened after some early Miami games, forcing a 52-yard field goal attempt from Uwe Von Schaumann. It was not a high percentage kick, and Von Schaumann missed it. The Dolphins checked the Bills on their first try, though, and moved downfield easily when they got the ball back. This set the stage for another Von Schaumann try. This one a little closer at 43 yards. But again, the Dolphin place kicker was unable to convert. Twice Miami had tried, but had come up short. Five minutes remained in overtime. And once more, it was Joe Ferguson who stepped to the forefront. Too often, his team had tasted defeat in the Orange Bowl. And now at long last, the Bills could sense that maybe this would finally be the day to erase a painful past with a victory in Florida. A Mike Mosley completion and two short runs set up a 36-yard field goal attempt by Joe Danello. And the ex-giant kicker drove a stake into the Dolphins' heart with a shot through the upright. After 17 years and nearly five full quarters of football, the Buffalo Bills had done it. The 38-35 victory ended the long drought against the Dolphins, while putting the Bills in a first-place tie in the AFC East. In ancient mythology, the character Sisyphus had been cursed with the task of carrying a heavy boulder up a mountain, only to see it roll back downhill every time. It was a curse he carried throughout his life, Against Miami, the Buffalo Bills until now had been a modern-day Sisyphus, but finally they had escaped this fate. In one of the most memorable wins in team history, the Bills beat both history and a great team. The Orange Bowl jinx was gone at last. Now, currently, we have 13 linebackers on our roster. But signing this one, Zach Thomas, back to this organization, and for him to retire as a Miami Dolphin, that's special. What Zach has been able to accomplish is a great example for every player on this team and every young player that plays this game. Smart, tough, disciplined, competitive, dependable, and most importantly, his passion to play the game the passion of which he played this game every single play of his career is what made him special. And today, on behalf of Stephen Ross and the entire Dolphin organization, I'm glad to announce that Zach Thomas is once again a Miami Dolphin. You are and always will be one of the most iconic Miami Dolphins ever to play the game here. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for setting the bar so high for my football team. You can rest assured that every one of those guys, when they walk through the door here, knows exactly who number 54 is. So I want to thank you, and I want to wish you all the luck in the world. Zach Thomas. Those were nice words from Tony and Jeff. Um, I'm a little 
little bit nervous right now, more nervous than any game I ever played in. I didn't even got the opening line out. I'm about to cry. Um, let me loosen it up a little bit. I want to introduce everybody to uh, a new uh, Dolphin fan, to the Dolphin family. You can bring him over here, Ruth. I just have to get a shot of him on this mic. So y'all watch out for Christian Zachary Thomas. He looks like a linebacker. Y'all know why I'm here and the reason I'm here. I'm here today to announce the retirement from this great game of football. You know, it's been both, you know, sad. I'm both sad and happy that after 28 years of football, I finally calling it quits. I'm happy because for the Miami Dolphin organization, they got a lot more things on their plate that are bigger than the retirement of Zach Thomas. And for them to go out of their way and have this day for me, I'm very grateful. The things I'm sad about, I'm sad that I'm gonna sad that I'm going to miss my second family. And the people I'm talking about is everybody in this organization. Oh, let me get, let me catch myself. You might want to pass me that, that bird cloth. <laughs> All right, get a hold of yourself. I'm not going to embarrass you, young man, so. Uh, but I'm also going to miss everything about with the preparation for the games, but especially the games on Sunday. But the preparation during the week is what I really miss. That's where I took it to another level and to its extreme. I always believe that you don't win on Sundays. You win during the week. And that's where I felt like I had the advantage. I felt like when most people went home after five o'clock, that's when I really got, I got the best of everybody. That's where I felt like I got my edge. I lasted 14 years, I'm very grateful. I felt like I was gonna play forever, and that wasn't the case, but I tried. To play a game and get paid for it and do something you love, not a lot of people can say they can do that. I did. It wasn't like a job to me. It was like recess. So bear with me, I got a lot of people I want to thank because of the 12 years, especially here with the Dolphins and, and 14 total years. But I got to start with my family. I'd like to start with my mom and dad. I mean, you know, they gave me every chance, every opportunity to take advantage of my dreams. They taught me great values and they taught me how to respect people and love what you do. My brother, he was my idol. My sister, she was my best cheerleader. And that's for my wife, Maritza. She's been great. She's been understanding for the countless hours that I put in here at work because she knew the love for the game that I had. And I thank you for that. Being successful is empty if you arrive there alone. And I didn't ride there alone. As for coaches, I think y'all know where I'm going to start. Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy took a chance on a slow, too short guy from a small town in Texas and brought him in here and gave him a chance. Didn't matter if it was fifth round. He took a small risk. But I got to say, I think he's an expert on evaluating talent. But there's a lot of coaches that, that really grew me, and the best thing was just to listen. The last and probably the most important was my high school coach, Max Plunk. He taught me the read that everybody thought was great instincts. I had the same read in high school as I did in my last game in the NFL, and I appreciate everything. I give him all the credit.
and I'm very thankful for him. And if it wasn't for meeting him, I wouldn't be up here today. I'm, not, I'm confident for that. To the whole Miami Dolphins organization, starting with Wayne and Marty Hazinga, nothing but first class. And there were so many people behind the scenes that I want to thank. And I think this is probably where I get emotional. Because of this game, because of the nature of the game, it's like a revolving door for coaches and players. But I never had such a bond with all the people behind the scenes in this building that don't really get all the credit, don't get the limelight, but they're here when you come to work, they're here when you leave. To the guys here in this room, the South Florida media, I want to thank you for all the great 14 years of coverage you had of myself. I definitely felt like you were fair and you showed a lot of respect. I hope I show you, you the same amount of respect as you show me over the years. Can't leave out my players on the ones that taught me how to be a pro. You got Dan Marino, best quarterback on the planet. The memories I used to have when I ever picked him off in practice, and it was only practice, I'd call my parents and tell them, hey, I picked Dan Marino off in practice. <laughs> and I think they were more excited about that than the interceptions I had in the game. But back to my defensive line, the guys that made my life easy, I can name them all off. You got Larry Chester, you got Tim Bowens, you got Daryl Gardner, you got Key Trailer, you got Jeff Scanina. Listen, I had so much confidence behind those guys with those big wide butts covering up all the linemen. I felt like I could make every play and I really wanted to make every play. I might've got up and did the celebrating. They did all the work, unselfish. And finally, for the fans, it's been a great ride. We've had our ups and downs, but I really feel like y'all have showed unconditional love for me for the whole time I was here. I'm sorry we couldn't bring you a Super Bowl ring. And now that I'm a fan, just like you guys, I know and excited, not just because they let me come here today, retire, but I know they're on the right track. And it's a process, and I like what they're doing. And I feel like they're gonna bring us a Super Bowl ring. Even if I'm not involved with the team, I will be a fan, and I'll be celebrating with these guys. I'd like to thank you also for your loyalty over the years to me. Didn't matter if I had a bad game or good. You always had my back. So I want to thank everybody for coming out today. I appreciate you, and go Dolphins.